Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to everyone. And um, warmly welcome to Helsinki. Um, Helsinki in November is maybe not um, your dream come true because we have a very peculiar weather. It is usually gray or grayer or the grayest. And uh, you can top it with either rain or then sleet. And this is why we have the slush meeting here in um, Helsinki in November, because slush is the feeling that we get in November when we have wet snow or, or sleet or water, and then the grayish feeling. But this is something unique that um, you can enjoy here. So um, I'm Maria Rita Pielman from the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and Employment here in Finland. Um, I'm a Director General and my responsibilities in the Ministry are um, regional development, cohesion policy, public employment services, etc. And I'm here to um, give you the opening speech and the regards of the um, Finnish EU presidency. Um, and I wish that you will have very fruitful discussions and encounters here during this seminar and, and during these um, days, days that you're spending here in, in Helsinki. Let's see how I can move this in a way that um, you can hear me and um, I can see my speech. All right, here we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf uh, of the ongoing Finnish presidency of the Council of the European Union, it is a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to welcome you all to this ESPON seminar in Helsinki. The first ESPON program was launched in 2002 with the aim to contribute to policymaking by revealing and understanding spatial trends. Since then, we have seen the program evolve to providing evidence and comparable information for regional development policies and reinforcing the effectiveness of EU cohesion policy and other sectoral policies. While we are still very much digesting the evidence produced by ongoing ESPON 2020 cooperation program, it is also time to plan the next generation of ESPON. For this, we have the valuable input from the midterm evaluation that pointed out ways to even more effective and policy relevant program. The ESPON 2020 cooperation program is an excellent starting point when designing a new program. A lot of effort has been put into producing timely and policy relevant territorial evidence. However, even more can be done. Understanding the needs and capacities of different target groups, including local and regional level, is crucial. Also, paying attention to the ways the knowledge is presented, delivered and communicated requires more attention and tailored approaches. As ESPON is a research program, high scientific quality has to be at fault. In the times of global challenges and increasing inequalities between places, there is a demand for solid territorial evidence production and knowledge building. Territorial approach can make visible and support decision making in different policy sectors help us to understand differences between places and to find place sensitive solutions. There is potential for even stronger role of ESPON to support the effective implementation of cohesion policy and territorial agenda. Distinguished guests, the urban agenda for the EU was launched in 2016 
um, brings together cities, member states, key stakeholders from civil society and European institutions to find ideas and ways to identify better policies for cities. As a first priority, Finnish presidency wants to support a successful implementation of the urban agenda to help to make its impact stronger and to build continuity for the agenda. In the light of the experiences so far, we see the urban agenda as a very promising institutional innovation to get cities better heard in the design of European policies. Secondly, a specific priority theme of the presidency is digital innovation in cities. This theme has been developed further in an ESPON policy brief, Digital Innovation in Urban Environments, that will be presented and discussed later today. Digitalization is one of the most influential cross-cutting drivers in societies and will continue in the future. Cities are favorable platforms for digitalization, which makes them hubs for digital solutions. Digital innovations may boost sustainable development, urban mobility, circular economy, and energy smart living, to give you just a few examples. However, we can see some challenges and shortcomings in the current smart city approach. On one hand, digital cities are somewhat dominated by technology push rather than innovation driven by challenges arisen from society, for example, cities. On the other hand, digital solutions are sometimes fragmented and isolated from each other without links to an overall digital strategy and design. Then, what is new in the approach we are striving for? We would like to put focus on cities and citizens as actors for the digital shift. In their new role, citizens can be seen as sources of urban data, um, as active subjects of civic-led governance, and thirdly, co-creators of innovations. That is why we point, point out a human-centric perspective. Also, we perceive uh, digitalization merely as a mean for desired and sustainable urban development uh, than a goal itself. So not a goal itself, but means for something better. Dear participants, when thinking about the sustainable future of European territories, we need a common vision, narrative, and joint actions. Actions have to be based on understanding strengths and development needs of towns, cities, and regions across Europe. The territorial agenda is currently being updated with these goals in mind. The newest draft version has recognized the most urgent challenges and priorities European territories face. It, is also, it also acknowledges the need and potential of multi-level and cross-sector cooperation in addressing complex issues. For a sustainable European territorial future, we need joint actions on climate change, demographic and social imbalances, cross-border and connectivity issues, and stronger local economies in a globalized world, just to name a few. A new instrument anticipated by the new territorial agenda will be the launch of pilot actions in order to achieve a just Europe and a green Europe that will be overarching objectives of the agenda. The pilot actions will be vehicles to tangible results across member states and sectors. We are currently aware of one pilot being developed and hope for others to come forward before the approval of the agenda in December 2020. 
Dear friends, the two days of the seminar will once again put the European territories in the spotlight. ESPAN 2020 Cooperation Program has a significant role to play in providing territorial evidence and turning it into knowledge and policy recommendations that are, <coughs> excuse me, that are relevant on local, regional, national and European level. In order to reach out and make sense of the evidence produced, we need events like this seminar that bring together people with different backgrounds and different expertise. I'm delighted to see that so many of you have overcome the darkness and arrived to Helsinki in November. To brighten up your stay, in addition to the seminar program, I have a pleasure to welcome you all to a seminar dinner tonight at the Cable Factory. I truly wish you an enjoyable seminar and a very, very meaningful encounters and discussions during the seminar. Thank you. So, good morning. Good morning and welcome everybody to our next ESPON seminar, this time in uh, Helsinki. Uh, we hope uh, you enjoy your time uh, in this uh, beautiful uh, city. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear participants, you are very welcome uh, to this um, event. And as you probably have noticed, this seminar is different, slightly because of the venue and also because of the program uh, that we offer uh, for you uh, for the coming days. It marks the beginning of a new era for ESPON, where we will become even more open, even more interactive, and even more influential. We worked very hard uh, in the past years uh, to create a vast knowledge base that uh, is now time to capitalize and share with all those that are designing development policies around Europe. Most of you have been working uh, for ESPON, with ESPON, uh, for a very long time. But um, let me ask you one question. What do you really know about ESPON? For example, do you know that in the current programming period, uh, we developed 22 policy guides to support the use of the results uh, um, by, the res by the policy makers? Uh, the complete list will be soon available uh, on our website and these guides encompass the essence of our projects and they offer a step-by-step -step guidance to policymakers to design policies that will improve the lives of their citizens. And this is just one type of product that ESPON offers to support better quality policymaking uh, across uh, European countries, cities and regions. In the past years, Together with you, we accomplished a lot. Our applied research, uh, targeted analysis, our tools offer an impressive volume of information and evidence to policymakers in a broad area of topics, from green infrastructure to youth unemployment, from metropolitan areas to circular economy. ESPON research touched upon all the big issues that are dominating the political debate on European, national, and uh, local level. But in ESPON, you know that quantity of information and evidence has never been a problem. Processing this information, codifying all this evidence, and promoting it in a coherent, systematic way, that is the real challenge for us. And it is now time to address this challenge Although ESPON results have been used already by several stakeholders in designing their planning policies, we can do more to capitalize this knowledge. We can offer more opportunities to policymakers to receive help from ESPON. I, I'm, I usually say that we are sitting on gold, a mountain of information that could benefit almost any local and regional authority in Europe. 
and we want to share these goals uh, and enrich the opportunities of local, regional and national policy makers to take evidence-based decisions for the future. But this is something that we, by we in this case I mean EGTC, cannot do it alone. And so my main message of today is that we need all of you. We need all of you to help us to promote the work of ESPON. We need all of you, our community, to go out there and share your experience uh, with ESPON, to bring the ESPON message to all policymakers at local, regional, national level that, that can help them to answer some of the very important questions that they are facing um, in their efforts to design development policies that will respond to the needs of the people beyond the boundaries of their administrative borders. So we need all of you to promote the work we did together in ESPON and be proud of it. If you're a stakeholder or a researcher, a consultant or a European contact point, you have contributed in creating this knowledge database that gives shape to a new way of developing strategies, uh, a way that is called a place-based approach but I would actually call it a people's-based approach. It is the approach that prioritizes connections instead of borders, solutions instead of problems, and it is now perfect timing to promote our knowledge and become an influential player in the field of development policy design. And the new programming period, as you know, is entering a very active design phase. National and local authorities are looking for input that will help them better assess their needs and benchmark them against other European players and pioneers. And they're also looking for tools and hands-on support for this exercise. They need the support of ESPON. They need your support. This is also one of the reasons why today we are presenting and discussing one of our key publications in the current programming period, the State of the European Territory Report that was prepared with this main major purpose of supporting uh, policy design, pol uh, policy development programming for post-2020 period. In the next months, we will intensify our efforts to reach out to policymakers. In the European Parliament, the Committee of the Regions, and together with the European Associations and also representations of regions in Brussels. Uh, together with our MC members, monitoring committee members, and also ECPs uh, to the member states and the regions, our aim is not just to present them our work, but to cooperate with them in tailoring our content to their needs. Our country fishes we are currently developing is just one example. And the guidebooks that I mentioned before we had developed in our project is also a ready-to-use solution we can offer. Another great opportunity to capitalize the knowledge of ESPON is the peer learning workshops. If you know an ESPON project that is relevant to your needs, ESPON can fund a workshop where the stakeholders of the project will present the findings and discuss with your team how these results can be applied in your case. If, for example, uh, you are interested to regenerate a port city, Ensure Project can present you 15 case studies from other European ports and give you insights from the analysis they did for the four stakeholder cities. And our most recent peer learning wor workshop was organized in Szczecin in Poland on, at the request of the Western Pomeranian Voivodeship and included re representatives of Coventry City Council and the federal state of uh, Vorarlberg and researchers of five different ESPON projects focusing on functional areas and cross-border cooperation. This is just one example of how a peer learning workshop can work <coughs> as a method in practice. We are also open to new challenges, new suggestions, your suggestions. We want to create more direct links with all stakeholders, all of you, to be able to understand and serve your needs, to support networking, exchange of best practices, and also capitalization of knowledge. If, what, if policymakers are one very important target group uh, of our program, researchers and academia is the second. And we are proud of our community and the expertise that we bring together and we believe that their work is our best ambassador. Therefore, we will shortly announce uh, a PhD researcher scheme to support the scientific work and publications of ESPON-related research. 
And it is our way to encourage new researchers also to engage with ESPON, uh, to rejuvenate our pool of experts and also to promote further our results among the scientific community. And there is one place where these two pillars meet, the media. The most important multiply and the best way to access broader audiences beyond our communities. And we are engaging with journalists more and more uh, in an effort to make ESPON more visible to the citizens uh, and offer our evidence to the public dialogue for the future of Europe. And in the next months, we will also invite for the first time European media to work with us and present stories based on our results, stories that they can develop with an absolute editorial of freedom. So all these different activities mark the, what I call the new era of ESPON. And this change starts today uh, from this seminar. It starts from all of us and from each one of you who can become and serve the uh, ESPON program as an ambassador with all the knowledge and with all the evidence, with all the good things that we are doing uh, for the program. At the same time, it also uh, is a challenge for the EGTC, and it's uh, in the great people of the EGTC that also a very large part of success lies. Uh, so now I would like to introduce to you our new head of unit for evidence and outreach, uh, Nicola Rossignol. We have completed the uh, recruitment, so please welcome Nicola. You probably remember before that we had Laurent, so now uh, Nicola is our new Laurent. Uh, but <laughs> most of you probably know him already as he was already a member of our team and I'm confident uh, that his knowledge of ESPON and also his previous experience working together with policymakers will prove to be very valuable uh, for us and, and for the work of uh, ESPON. So congratulations and, and welcome. And also you have probably noticed a different program that we used to have in previous seminars. As you can see, we dedicated more time for debates we opened our sessions to journalists from around Europe and also we included high-level policymakers in our debates. So we are honored uh, today to have the Vice President of the Committee of the Regions, Mr. Marco Marcula, uh, and uh, a very experienced European uh, politician, Lambert van Nistelrooy, who will also join us for the panel deba debate, and also Johanna Rautianen from uh, the uh, Finnish uh, presidency. And this time, we assigned two EU-level journalists to present our work. It is an opportunity for us to see ESPON's work, our work, from a different perspective, to understand how it is uh, perceived uh, by somebody who has so far maybe be, has been more an outsider to the, to the program and its content, but also to give an opportunity uh, to our presenters to decode our messages, translate them in simple words, and help us uh, to reach a broader audiences. So now I welcome and give the floor to um, Terry Martin. Terry, uh, welcome, a Deutsche Welle journalist uh, who will present to us the state of the European territory and uh, then he will be followed by Samuel Stolten, a journalist in Euractive uh, who will present our latest policy brief on digital uh, innovation in urban areas. So Terry, Samuel, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. And we are looking forward to your presentations. And for the rest of you, please enjoy the two days of the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilona. Um, my name is Terry Martin. I'm, as she pointed out, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I'm, I work with Germany's foreign broadcasting service, Deutsche Welle. I'm a, I'm a news anchor. I deal mainly with uh, international news, but also with European affairs. I'm based in Berlin. And I also work with European Union research projects, mainly framework uh, research projects, uh, supporting them with their communications needs in social sciences and humanities. I wrote a small guidebook called Communicating Research for Evidence-Based Policymaking. I wrote that for the European Commission's Research Directorate. And through that, I got to know ESPON, and uh, I've, I'm fascinated with the work that ESPON has been doing, and it's a great privilege for me to be here today to present this extremely important and dense report on the state of the European territory. My task over the next 30 minutes is, is to try to help you get an idea of what this report is about, what's in it, why it was created, and what it's intended to achieve. I will also attempt to extract specific messages from the report that 
I, I find relevant and that uh, perhaps will support you in your work as policymakers and perhaps uh, researchers and others who uh, could benefit from it. So I'm going to get started. 30 minutes to present a, a compre comprehensive report that includes input from numerous research projects, dozens of research projects over a couple of years covering very complex uh, policy fields is a daunting task, but I will do my best. Bear with me. The, first of all, uh, a quick raise of hands. Uh, how many of you have actually seen the PDF version or online version of this report? Ah, that's great. Okay, so I can assume that you've had time to flip through it. Maybe you've uh, sat up all last night and read every word of it, and, and uh, you, you, you'll know more than I do. But I'm only going to go through, through this for 30 minutes, and then we're going to have another presentation on digital innovation in urban cities, and then we're going to have a discussion. And in the discussion, we're going to go, going to go into more detail, and that will give you an opportunity to also provide some input for that discussion. So let's get started with the report. That's a copy of the cover. There is not a print version yet, but when it comes out, that's what it's going to look like. And my first, my first slide just simply points out that what it is, it is evidence and advice to help policymakers. In one short phrase, that is what this is all about. You all know that. Most of you are familiar with ESPON, have already worked with ESPON, have attended many of these seminars in the past, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail about that. I'm an outsider. I don't work for ESPON, so I'm coming at this from a completely different angle than many of you who are very familiar with ESPON. The, if, you, if you've read into the, the foreword to this report, the introduction, you will see a reference to what's described as a mismatch. And this mismatch affects uh, all sorts of things. It's, and you know more about this than I do. But this is what fascinates me about ESPON, is that ESPON looks at the European Union with the borders removed. It looks at patterns of development, be it in the economic sphere, in environmental issues, uh, dealing with labor policy. It looks at, at, at Europe with the borders removed and tries to look at what's working and wh where is potential there that hasn't been exploited yet. And that's what fascinates me personally about the work that ESPON is doing. This mismatch between the recognized challenges and the administrative borders is what this report tries to address. So what's in the report? Obviously, there is an overview of, of trends, and these, these trends involve both the challenges that European regions are facing, territories are facing, but also the opportunities that are there, the potential that could be exploited. And of course, it contains advice on, on how to go about it. The advice is important, but it's also really important to define what the challenges are. And much of the research that went into the report, of course, focuses on where the problems are, tries to identify what needs to be worked on, and then, then you have the policy advice following on for that. So what's it for? Also, in a nutshell, um, we know that we're talking about the next funding period, the post-2020 funding period, dealing with the territorial agenda and cohesion policy, an extremely important um, framework for the European Union cohesion being a, a word that not everyone can meet or relate to immediately. All of you know what I'm talking about. My wife, who is a politician, however, when I mention the word cohesion to her, and she, her eyes glaze over, and she says, you know, what are you talking about? She's a minister in, in one of Germany's state governments, and she's like, cohesion, right. What, does, what is that? Um, we're dealing with very abstract things. We have to remind ourselves, I think it's really important to take a step back and remind ourselves that we're dealing with very abstract uh, policy ambitions here, but this is the language of the European Union. So, Fortunately, this report breaks it down into nice little packages that helps us uh, understand it. Let's first, I'm just going to give you one slide on challenges and one slide on opportunities, and then we're going to get into the report itself. These are kind of takeaway messages from the report for me. When I read it and I saw these, these phrases, these phrases jumped out at me. And for me, as a journalist dealing with European affairs and international affairs, when I see words like, a place is becoming increasingly fragmented, 
uh, that tells me that, hmm, we've got some, some serious issues happening there. What does fragmentation mean? We'll find out in a minute. We've got these disparities, and this is another important observation, that aren't so much between the countries, but between the various r municipalities, the regions within the countries. You all know that at this point. Um, but for, for outsiders, that not, that's not necessarily intuitive. Um, many people think about the European Union, 28 countries, maybe 27 soon. Uh, and they think about disparities between the individual countries kind of competing with each other for money coming for Brussels or paying into Brussels, and they think in those terms. But from a regional perspective, it's very different, as we all know. And anybody working in a regional uh, or municipal government uh, understands that this is, uh, this is something else. But to, to, for this report, which condenses two years of research, the last two years, to come out and say, that it's becoming increasingly pronounced, these disparities between the individual municipalities and regions and territories. That's a, that's a profound conclusion, I find. And then here is the, a point that catches every policymaker's uh, attention. When you say that this sort of, this fragmentation, which expresses itself in some cases as discontent, when that becomes extreme, it can spill over into political instability. Now, this report doesn't go into what that, how that would, could find expression, but I think we all know of cases within the European Union, I know of them very well in Germany, where political instability is beginning to, uh, to appear. So, enough of the challenges. There are opportunities, and that's, the, that's a big part of this report too, of course. Um, three, I just picked out three. One is, of course, recognizing that there are issues, recognizing that there is a need, that these territorial ish challenges can't be addressed with some sort of broad approach. You need very specific, uh, very specific solutions to deal with specific problems. There is growing support for the work of of ESPON for ESPON's approach, which which takes a more place, which takes a place-based approach, rather than looking with it at it from a territorial blind perspective, and there's now over the over several years, also because of the work that ESPON has been doing, but lots of other sources as well. There's a buildup of experience that can support this approach as we move forward, and that will carry over into the post 2020 planning period for the territorial agenda and cohesion policy. So let's get into some of the details, unpacking the report. The, uh, this is a very compact synthesis, uh, as you can imagine, uh, as you all know, of existing uh, S1 evidence and research. You are all familiar, I suspect, with the work that has gone into it in terms of the individual research projects and the policy briefs and the position papers that were condensed into this 130 pages. There are three versions of the report. There's the PDF version, which most of you have already seen. There's, the, there's going to be a print version, a paper version, of course. That's not quite ready yet, but it will be. Um, but most people will be accessing it online anyway who wants to carry around a heavy report. And there's this extremely valuable online version. It's still a beta version at this point. The, um, oops, the, uh, let's see if I can get this. Where's my pointer? I have a pointer somewhere, but it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, up there you can see at the very top of the slide the URL for accessing the online version. And the online version for me is fascinating because it, it includes lots of maps, of course, that you have seen before, I suspect. These maps can be found in each of the different chapters. Um, and the maps are broken down into layers, so you can superimpose different layers of data on top of, of one another. and one of the very cool things about it is that you can produce a custom report uh, using this online version. So you can go through it and find, you can say, ah, this interests me, that does not interest me, so I click on this in the menu. I'm not gonna go through this, we don't have time, but you can produce custom reports that'll fit your individual needs um, as whatever they may be. So, the report itself broken down into five chapters. I've given it some color just to help guide us through the presentation as we move along. The, um, what's important to know about 
these five chapters is that they are directly linked to the regional development and cohesion policy priorities that are coming up in the 2020 cohesion period. So the next planning period for cohesion policy. So this is extremely important to understand. This will fit into that process of developing the co cohesion policy. We should hope that it will feed into it and, and help to inform it in a way that will find expression in policy. Um, I'm going to spend a little more time with Smarter Europe before I get into the other chapters, but I'm just going to pick out a couple of examples um, dealing with pattern of patterns of innovation and with the knowledge economy. In terms of um, patterns of innovation, there are these five typologies. I'm going to have to flip through these pretty fast to get through this in half an hour. Uh, but out of these typologies, in terms of one Move one being perhaps more advantageous for one reg region than another, trying to move towards a specific typology that might be more beneficial for a given region, we're finding movement, right? The research has been able to, uh, first of all, identify these regions and uh, classify them into different categories and to say, and to recognize the dynamics that are happening within these regions. I find that significant, uh, that they are able to say, this is where most of the movement is happening, and this is um, moving what they're calling here from a smart technological application pattern to an applied science area. We're going to we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. We have uh, this map that shows, again, a breakdown of regions according to innovation in this whole context of innovation patterns, innovation systems in this case. Here they are ranked. This is the European Commission's ranking of them. Um, you will find them online. Of course, the most of the, you're going to see slight, most of the innovation patterns in the less innovative sector, the lower half of the, of the table as opposed to the top half. So, so we have 38 innovation leaders. You can see where they're concentrated. Again, this is, all I can do is scratch the surface on this report. We're not going to be able to get into details. Each one of these slides you could spend 15 minutes on, but I'm only going to be able to skip over a lot of it just to introduce you. So this is an important part of the report. So the report will give you an introduction, each chapter an introduction to the topic, an overview of the different uh, research projects that went into it, and then there's a section on policy options and tools, and this is perhaps the most valuable part of each chapter. They're beautifully structured chapters. And in dealing with uh, innovation, innovation patterns. Here are two sets of things you can do. Options on the left, some tools on the right, things that you are probably already familiar with. But it's, what's important for you to see is that you look for that light bulb sign and you're going to be at the options and tools. There are also case studies. I'm only going to pick out two, one in relation to the first chapter and that concerns a, an automotive, the automotive industry in Slovakia, which as we all know has expanded wonderfully and they're very proud of that. They right, should rightly be proud of it. That particular region, talking about patterns of innovation, uh, it has transitioned from an imitative, what they call an imitative uh, innovation region to what they're describing in the research as a smart and creative diversification region. But how they did that is, uh, you know, the process of understanding how that happened is really important. And the key thing to understand there is that the technology from the large automotive companies that set up their operations there was transferred from the mothership, wherever that might be, Germany, for example, to um, to Bratislava, and th that process went on for some time, but eventually, by cooperating with the universities and the businesses and the manufacturers and the municipalities, that knowledge became internalized and the processes of producing it were, were replicated, which resulted in not an imitative uh, model, but instead its own smart and creative stuff. So the innovation is happening there now, as opposed to the innovation being parachuted in from Bolsbog. The other thing I want to point out, or the other aspect I want to pick out from this chapter is the knowledge economy. Uh, so we've talked about innovation patterns, and the second example I want to look at is the uh, knowledge economy part of it. We talked about the uh, about various territorial challenges. Um, how do you go about helping those part those places that aren't doing performing as well as they would like without 
without taking anything away from the companies that are from the areas that are already performing extremely well. This um, is described as the competitiveness cohesion trade-off, uh, and it's a it's one of the fundamental challenges that has been re is recognized in this report. It's an overarching uh, overarching issue that has to be addressed in dealing with the territorial agenda. I'm going to skip through this, or I won't finish my presentation in time. This is a regional classification of knowledge economy. You can find this and zero in on it. You can zoom in on it, on it online uh, with the online version of the report. There are strategies for supporting the development of the knowledge economy. I can't go through those, but you know where they are, right? They're in the report. Spend some time looking into this. This is purely to tease you, to get you to look to see, okay, well, five potential strategies to support development of a knowledge economy, something everybody wants. How do you do it? Well, it's in there. Uh, there are these policy options and tools, very condensed versions of, of how you can approach the issue, uh, building your various opportunities, uh, you know, branding, I mean, but it depends what kind of region you are. So this is also broken down in terms of if you are, are a lagging peripheral rural region, you might approach it this way. If you're a more developed region, you might approach it that way. So let me check on my time here, see how I'm doing. Okay, I'm, I'm okay. So we're into the second chapter on uh, the green low carbon Europe. This is another big policy priority, another big policy goal. It's also a chapter of research uh, with numerous research projects directed to it. I'm not going to list the research projects that went into all of this. They are all included in the report itself, so you'll find, find that there if you want to reference the individual reports and then back out of this over, overarching report to get to the very specific policy briefs and projects that will assist you in, in trying to, to do your work. So. The beauty of ESPON, and Ilona was talking about gold, sitting on gold and trying to share the gold, uh, in trying to share the gold that comes out of the research, uh, what ESPON helps to do is look at these very complex interactions dealing with achieving a greener, low-carbon Europe, dealing with issues that involve green infrastructure, the ener energy transition, your climate, your climate change and uh, circular economy challenges. ESPON looks at this from different perspectives, collates the information, tries to put together a synthesis of the results from these research projects, overlay them on the territorial challenges that they've identified, uh, put them in the form of maps and, and other areas that you can try to comprehend. This is what, this is the, at least this is the goal that ESPON has. Whether it works or not, I'll leave the, that for you to judge. Um, uh, Ilona was saying there's still work that can be done. Uh, of course, everything can be, can be better, but this is the attempt. So here's just a slide on green innovation, uh, green innovation networks uh, serving multiple policies at landscapes, but you can see the, the breakdown of the, the way these three types of functionalities are, are described in terms of monofunctional, bifunctional, multifunctional areas distributed around Europe. What you can do again online is take the map that has different layers, take this map, break it down, focus, zoom in on, on a particular area and it's broken down into the, into the subsections that will reveal more detailed information. But in terms of promoting the circular economy, uh, these are the two, what I saw as the, the main message coming out of that chapter. Uh, the, this, this is basically a description of what a circular economy is, and because, when again, these we're dealing with very abstract concepts, so if you're going to try to, to create a circular economy in your area, you have to you know, begin by understanding what it is, uh, and this is the, a nice description of what it is in, an, in a nutshell that comes through in this, in this report as well, which I'm, I'm very happy that the report deals with fundamental issues as well. Here's a, here's a set of policy options and tools to support uh, to support this transition and where there's an also a, a an example that is given. This is a case study, one of the many case studies that you'll find in the report. This is the case of Greater Manchester. Greater Manchester is a post-industrial part of 
England that has suffered considerably economically, but also pretty severe uh, social impact of the economic transition. It is transitioning, trying to transition towards a more of a knowledge economy and also a trying to cope with its energy poverty, which is quite extreme there, uh, according to the report. And it's managed to do that uh, in creating a, a low carbon service oriented economy and it use, uses very specific uh, strategies for doing that. It involves a lot of cooperation between you know, it's the greater Manchester region, so there are lots of individual uh, centers, municipalities that cooperate, but they are reducing their CO2 outputs radically, and they are at the same time coming up with a, a way of helping people access energy in a way that is going to, to support them, also businesses. But these individual op policy, when you see the policy options and tools again, these played a role very much in, in that transition, and that's what the research from ESPA has revealed. Third chapter, more connected Europe. Um, two parts to this, transport and communications. The communications involves a lot on, on digitalization, which we're going to hear more about uh, in the next presentation, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Transport is something which a lot of research has been de devoted to. Uh, I saw more than a dozen reports or a dozen research projects that f in the report that fed into this particular section dealing with transport. So there are many, many uh, sections, uh, report, many, many research projects focusing on transport. I'm going to focus a little more on the, the, te the IT part of it. But the four freedoms of the European single market, it's very important to remind ourselves why this is important. And these four freedoms about mobility, um, the movement of goods, capital, services, and persons, depend on the development of this kind of infrastructure, as you all know. So what we're seeing, what the research has revealed, that ESPON has produced, that this report describes, is a, a similar pattern of lack of connectivity in the digital world that there is in the, in the physical accessibility. There, there's a visible the pattern, this core periphery pattern uh, duplicates itself. I guess that's not a huge surprise, um, but what we, what we do know is that if you can overcome it, then you can counter that process of peripheralization. I said it, didn't I? Peripheralization. It's not an easy word to say. So here's a, here's a map supporting reflecting that research and what's been what's been identified again I'm, this is something that is best looked at online when you can zoom in on the individual areas and you can lay different put different layers over top of it but this uh, is very valuable in understanding and visualizing and understanding where the challenges lie I'm not convinced that it's a hundred percent accurate because I spend a lot of time in in certain parts there that I don't think should be blue. I think they should be somewhere more in the red zone. When, and in Germany, there's this word called Funkloch. If uh, any of you are familiar with that, it's just, it's when you pass through an area where there is suddenly no connectivity. You're, you your phone connection is down. And if you don't have any internet access in an, in an area, you're not going to even have a plumber set up a business, right? It's, um, it's absolutely essential. Anyway, this is, um, I found this very interesting. More social Europe. Uh, this is perhaps the one of you know, the biggest challenge. How do you how do you overcome some of the social fragmentation? This I find uh, very disturbing because this is politically for policymakers. If you see Europe coming apart at the seams, if you see things a l the cohesion going in the wrong direction. Uh, you're up against some very difficult challenges that are going to permeate your work. Uh, anyway, this is talking about demographics, uh, telling us some, everything, something we already knew. We knew, know the population is aging. We know that there, uh, some areas are growing while some get smaller, but this is having a, a severe impact in understanding how to deal with shrinking cities and how to deal with the urban growth challenges are, are enormous. Um, 
But looking at some of the specifics of the challenges that are, that are affecting uh, social Europe, the, the gig economy, this I found particularly interesting. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the gig economy. Uh, those of you who deal with labor policy and also with social affairs are going to be very familiar with it. Uh, there are a lot of people who are now operating with no insurance, no job security, moving from one tiny micro uh, contract to another. Uh, this affects everything from PhD, people with uh, you know, academics with advanced degrees to people with no uh, school leaving degree. But uh, this is something that for policymakers and for regional planners and for planners of all kinds of uh, you know, everything that has to do with the way that society is organized, have to think about really carefully. And this makes very strong recommendations to spend more time examining this because we're just beginning to understand it. But this I, I found to be a very interesting conclusion coming out of this report. Analy need to analyze the cost and benefits and to decide how to support and regulate this sector. I suspect this is going to find its way into the next cohesion policy planning period. These are the, this is just a, I found a very useful map on people with, uh, particularly young people with uh, no education uh, uh, or training opportunities who are not currently engaged in the system. So it's basically we're talking about people really beginning to fall out of the social cohesion system. Again, a map best viewed online. And Finally, this uh, I think is significant in terms of cross-border labor market integration, how to go about that um, and what value it would have. What the research that ESPON has developed has identified is that there is significant potential for cross-border services to support um, also employment and that it is un largely underused, that there that potential is there, it's underused, and then, then of course the next uh, question is, how do you begin to use it? And these, the answers to that, of course, are within the other parts of this report that deal with other factors that we've been talking about, including connectivity and overcoming um, borders, also using digital technology. Finally, uh, on this, and the fifth chapter, this, uh, this picture, by the way, I made it in Belfast two months ago. I was there recording a, a special on borders and barriers in Europe, and I came across this peace wall. There's a peace wall. <laughs> there are also the peace lines. If any of you have all ever, ever been to Belfast, there's this one particular wall that seems to be, de tries to dedicate itself to positive messages, but this is not the most positive message. And as you all know, Northern Ireland is now in the throes of, of preparations for Brexit, and there is great concern that the troubles will resume and that there could be serious uh, unrest there. But the point is that this fragmentation, again, the, and growing discontent of European citizens with EU institutions threatens the entire European project. So this could give greater urgency to the European cohesion policy and efforts to bring this a little closer to people and help them understand what the European Union is or is not doing for them. Because as I just showed you earlier in this presentation, the threat of political instability is very much there. So I'm going to need to wrap this up real quickly. I'm running over time. One of the positive points that has come out of the research dealing with getting Europe closer to citizens is the recognition that there are new territorialities. And this is also what underpins the need for more t uh, place-based research to identify what these territories are, uh, that there are new structures that are there of that are beginning to form with or without support from the policy community that need to be recognized and, uh, and maybe duplicated and developed and trying to understand. So there's a lot, lot, lot going on there. And this is one of the main takeaways from all of this for me from the report, that the, the need to either come up with a more functional governance model or a, or a combination of territorial governance and functional governance. One of the things that I've learned by looking at Espan's research 
is just how valuable it can be to, again, not look so much at territories. The, the territorial administrative boundaries are there, but if you are to to help develop the, an, an area's potential, uh, we're gonna have to think more in terms of functional governance. Finally, the uh, these are the four main, rather abstract but important conclusions from the report. Uh, just my own personal critical opinion of what makes the report valuable. The conclusions at the end are okay, but I find the, the, the true added value to be in the individual chapters and the individual conclusions of the reports that this, you know, I'm giving you an introduction to a report which is an introduction to the research that is behind it. So this, we're three layers removed from where you might want to spend, focus your attention. This puts it in a nice nutshell, the report, and, but it, and it, it helps you to find out where you might want to look because the report then gives you access to the individual research projects, the findings, the policy briefs, the position papers, and the maps that are online, uh, and of course, the, the people at SBON who can, can direct you where you need to go. Thank you. <laughs> Samuel Stolton is up next with Digital Innovation in Urban Areas. Thank you very much, Terry, for that, uh, that explication of the report. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I must say I haven't seen too much of the slush yet on the streets of Helsinki, so it makes it even more of a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Samuel Stolton. Uh, I'm the digital editor at Euractiv in Brussels. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm British, uh, so apologies in advance for that. <laughs> it's a burden that we'll bear heavily in Brussels at the moment. Um, nonetheless, we're still in. Um, I'm here today to talk about the report Digital Innovation in Urban Environments and this is very much my own take on the key messages uh, in the report. Uh, before I start I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Finnish Presidency of the EU for the kind invitation here today and ESPON as well and I also commend ESPON for putting the fruits of their labour into the hands of journalists. It's a courageous, bold and brave move and hopefully it pays off. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'd like to start by perhaps talking about the problem that we have faced so far with regards to the development of digital innovations in smart cities across the European Union. Defining what a smart city actually is has been one of the key challenges. And we've had definitions from the European Commission, we've had definitions from the Smart Cities Council, the United Nations, the OECD, we've had definitions from Cisco, IBM, all differing viewpoints on what the smart city actually represents. Uh, and of course, this has resulted in, shall we say, a divergence between how approaches have been adopted and how stances have been taken up so far. Now, the technologists, shall we say those in the private sector, have been very keen indeed to uh, present technology as the be-all and end-all. So technology should be pursued for its own means itself, just for the sake of uh, advancing technology generally. Now, I think this perspective personally is flawed because it papers over the cracks in our urban society and does not directly confront emerging social and cultural challenges identified by citizens and end users of technologies themselves. So far, as has been previously highlighted, smart city initiatives have broadly been uh, defined by technology push rather than addressing the issues of citizens. Now, of course, this isn't always the case, and there have been different approaches across the EU, and we're moving towards more of a citizen-led uh, initiative in this regard. Of course, when our values are sidelined in the pursuit of technological advance for the sake of itself, we end up with situations where unlicensed taxi drivers are offering lifts on Uber, who would have thought it? Or Airbnb driving up gentrification and pushing up costs for local indigenous communities. Technology can be used for so much more. Uh, here's a brief uh, overview about some of the solutions identified by McKinsey 
as uh, what smart applications and emerging technologies poised to have effect on the cities in 2025 or until 2025 uh, could be in the future. And we have some really interesting ones here. Gunshot detection technology, autonomous vehicles, obviously the next generation of connected transport, smart irrigation systems, water quality monitoring, optimization of waste collection routes. These are all problems in society or perhaps not problems, at least obstacles in society that could be addressed by technology. Technology doesn't merely have to be an adage. And sometimes when technology is presented by the technologists and the private sector to local and public authorities, it can sometimes exacerbate social and urban problems. And this is really what we want to try and avoid. So one example of this, we're going to go across the Atlantic now to New York City and link NYC. Uh, and I think this acts as a good example of the risks of pursuing technology for the means of technology itself. So in 2016, thousands of payphones in the city were replaced by digital kiosks, which offered free internet access, free domestic phone calls, USB charging ports, and interactive maps. However, the project came with caveats. It wasn't a public service offered by New York City. It was owned and operated by Sidewalk Labs, a subsidiary of Google. And of course, the challenges that this brought up was the fact that Google was harvesting data and using it for targeted advertising. Now, of course, what solution in society is this solving? Uh, what problem, sorry, in society is this solving? And indeed, it caused a backlash at the time. Uh, this is a quote from a local journalist, Nick Pinto, of the Village Voice, uh, which is a lower Manhattan newspaper. And his words are quite strong here. Link NYC marks a radical step even for Google. It is an effort to establish a permanent presence across our city, block by block, and to extend its online model to the physical landscape we humans occupy on a daily basis. The company then intends to clone that system and start selling it around the world, government by government, to as many as will buy. And of course, they have started doing this. Similar solutions have already appeared, or at least are in the early stages in London and Paris. And when you have the media uh, with these kinds of opinions, of course, it's highly likely that the citizens themselves will be thinking in a similar line. This is a fantastic quote from Ben Green, who's the author of The Smart Enough City. It's a brilliant book. Um, I think it's well worth any policymakers in the room picking up a copy of this the next time you're in a bookshop. It's very, very uh, relevant with regards to how policymaking and smart city development can be paralleled in a holistic and human-centered way. So Ben Green says that everybody desires better public services, but if deploying them entails setting up corporate surveillance nodes throughout public centers, what kind of cities are we to create? And I think this is the question that we all need to have at the, back, at the front of our minds uh, when we're considering the policies for the smart cities of tomorrow. What kind of cities do we want to create? Now, it's not all doom and gloom so far. There have been ecosystems of innovation emerging, and this is something highlighted in the Digital Innovation in Urban Environments report uh, quite clearly. Uh, we're increasingly seeing human-centered and holistic approaches uh, with regards to the development of smart city solutions. Um, and these are two key words, if any, that I would recommend that you take away uh, from today's presentation and the policy brief in general. The fact that the solutions of tomorrow should be pursued in a way that's human-centric and holistic. Now, one particular, shall we say, strand of this human-centric approach is the principle of co-creation, which co-creation essentially involves engaging end users in the development process of a technological solution, employing multidisciplinary viewpoints and bridging the traditional silos of government, industry, academia, civil society, and citizens. The principle of co-creation is happening more and more across the European Union, and this is something that we're going to take a look at some closer examples later on in my presentation. Open Innovation 2.0 is a key element of co-creation. So the idea includes involving these end users from the very beginning. The people that will be using these technologies on our streets, in and around our continent, are involved from the beginning, because that's the only way we can really address these problems in our society, and indeed identify what these problems actually are in the beginning. So, the European Commission has highlighted the five 
principles of Open Innovation 2.0, and they include networking, collaboration, por corporate entrepreneurship. Of course, these ideas, it's important that we make them financially sustainable in the long term. Pro proactive intellectual property management, creating new markets for technology, and research and development. And these can be pursued in a number of means. And let's have a look at how these have been pursued so far across the European Union. So this map shows us the scale of co-creation projects across the EU in different areas. And there are several things that we notice here. Firstly, that the landscape for these types of projects is fractured, with not as many occurring in Europe's central and eastern parts. And secondly, that the major urban areas are hives for this type of activity. And this is hardly surprising. Uh, by 2050, it is estimated that 80% of the worldwide population will live in cities. As a result, urban areas simply need to use innovation as a means to stay sustainable in the long term. Now, what I would say about this is, later on we're going to address how depopulation in rural areas could actually present challenges on the other side of the spectrum, where uh, urban centres, urban hives, metropolitan cities will be crowded with people. Rural areas will actually be left with a problem of its own of depopulation, and this is something we'll talk about briefly uh, later on. Let's have a look at, in a bit more detail about one city that has already started to address the challenges of tomorrow. Amsterdam. So Amsterdam's smart city platform is a place where collaboration, open innovation and citizen involvement are encouraged to take place. It was established in 2009 and has since facilitated close to 100 projects aimed at making the city smarter. We can see the broader goals of the project here. And of course, a lot of these parallel with many of the principles outlined in ESPON's policy brief, avoiding government bureaucracy and siloed thinking, quick moving shared pu public private partnerships and encouraging involvement from as far afield as possible, bringing people together to find out the solutions of tomorrow. The smart city platform is essentially a website where people can go online, submit their ideas uh, for different types of projects, highlight the issues that are really important um, to be addressed in their local uh, or wider community and find partners and collaborators to work and solve these burgeoning problems of tomorrow. But it, all, it didn't start out like that, of course. The first iteration of Smart City uh, was kind of pounced upon by the technologists who came along and said, oh, we've got the perfect solution for you. We can solve your problem. IBM, Cisco were very keen to jump on board at the beginning. And a, a quite incredible quote from Amsterdam's chief technology officer, Ger Baron, emerged. And he said, every company that comes here and tells us how it works, they're wrong because they don't have a clue how a city works. There's a big difference between how people think it works and how it works. And the key thing is today, I think, for all of us to remember, is the only people who know how a city works is the people themselves, the citizens on the ground. And to alienate themselves from the future development of smart city initiatives is a grave mistake and one that I think we make at our peril. So let's have a look at Amsterdam's smart city platform now in a bit more detail. Is there sound, sorry, on the video? Residents, the municipality and knowledge institutions to develop and realize smart solutions for today's urban challenges. Today, we're more connected than ever to the people and technology around us. Solar and wind energy powers our homes while a smart app tells us when our car needs to be charged. Sometimes technology is the driving force behind innovation. Sometimes it's common sense. Take a ladder, for instance. You may only need it a couple of times a year, so why not share it? The same goes for energy. If you generate more than you need, you can give your surplus to your neighbor or sell it. By working together smartly and openly share knowledge and data with one another.
It's never good hearing the sound of an alarm at this time in the morning. It kind of uh, brings back terrible memories. <laughs> um, this is an example here of some of the projects on uh, Amsterdam's Smart City Initiative. Um, so we have various um, projects here that people have jumped on board and expressed their uh, intention to get involved with and help out. Um, perhaps the most interesting one for us today is the City Data Project. Um, it's a great example of how the city has made all of its publicly available data open source. So anyone can access this information and anyone can add further data sets to the collection itself. City data is available and it is easy to search, download or link to your own system. And here's an example of some of the data sets that you can actually look for. Uh, we've got themes ranging from governance and organisation, population, service, economy port, education, youth diversity, etc. These are really, really valuable data sets that can be used for the technologies of tomorrow and help to enrich the lives of our citizens all over the continent. Of course, it's not just in Holland. We have some fantastic projects here as well in Finland, uh, particularly in the city of Leite, which has established its own CityCap initiative. It's a personal carbon trading scheme that incentivizes environmentally friendly transport decisions. And this is all about not just involving uh, citizens in the process of developing smart city solutions, but it's about using technology as a means to pursue wider and broader sustainable goals in society. They obviously don't have too much slush in Leite. <laughs> uh, it looks like a very beautiful city. If I was here longer, I would love to visit. Unfortunately, I'm not. Dubrovnik, Croatia's smart city 2016. So the local authorities in Dubrovnik uh, really wanted to engage citizens in the process of uh, developing smart city solutions. Uh, and they spoke to people and they said, what are the two most pressing issues uh, for citizens in our city today? The citizens responded, tourists, one, and secondly, uh, parking. Uh, more on the parking aspect. Uh, as a result of that feedback given by the citizens, the city developed smart parking sensors and built an app so that people's expectations could be managed more easily. Now, this ne wasn't necessarily to encourage more people to drive, but hopefully the opposite. I suppose the, uh, the intended outcome was that people would check the app, see that there were no uh, parking spaces available, then perhaps think about getting a su more sustainable mode of transport into the city, maybe even possibly walking. Um, so this is another example of perhaps how uh, technological solutions can help sustainability while also involving the citizens from the very beginning of the development process. Other smart Dubrovnik projects include solar powered benches uh, where people can charge their devices uh, and Dubrovnik I, uh, which allows citizens to report various uh, misdemeanors or potential crimes uh, in the city to the local authorities in a timely and efficient manner. Now, of course, all the data is public and available online, something that reflects the open data approach which underpins the Smart City program and also, I think, is important politically in terms of transparency. Now, of course, these things cost money. Um, Around 14% of GDP, the public authorities, is currently spent on procuring these types of services and products. And this is highlighted in the ESPON report. Uh, and of course, this is a rather big burden for local authorities uh, to provide an outlay for. Uh, one way of perhaps circumventing um, this cost 
is by pooling this purchasing power in establishing partnerships to strategically procure innovative solutions. Um, there's been a couple of ways that this has been done so far in Europe uh, by establishing a network of cities to work on projects together. So with a joint purchasing power, cities have more authority, shared expertise, and have a broader range of data sets to collaborate on future projects. Of course, cities are natural candidates for this also uh, because they can use this um, new purchasing power to get better uh, solutions. One particular project, Select for Cities, um, is something being worked on by Antwerp, Copenhagen and Helsinki. Uh, they've launched a competition open to all European companies to develop an open user-centric platform enabling the co-creation of IoT applications and services. Um, something that uh, is fascinating for me also is the Fabulos project, which sounds very, very interesting indeed. And uh, I believe Helsinki is also a a partner on this project um, and I'd very much like to be invited back to try out this project so if there's anyone in the audience working on this project please uh, please keep note of my interest here. Uh, this is the idea of procuring the operations of an autonomous bus line. We can see we have a range of cities working on the project here and not only that there are more observant cities following this project and looking at the intended outcomes and maybe how they can learn uh, from this type of procedure. That's the Fabulos project. Of course, it's not all about cities. Uh, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, um, I think by 2050, 80% of the world's population will be concentrated in, in major urban areas, urban metropolitan cities rather. And this also creates a problem for the rural areas in Europe who could face alienation from the smart city developments of tomorrow. Uh, we can see here um, a map of the share of people who have interacted with public authorities online. And of course, there is a gaping difference uh, across the EU here. Um, there have been a bit of shameless self-promotion here. My interview with Frank Bogovic, uh, he has been actively campaigning for the rollout of smart villages uh, across the European Union. Um, this is particularly of interest, again, in Central and Eastern Europe whereby the agricultural sector is one of the most important um, parts of a local uh, uh, authority's uh, economy. And what they're finding is that a lot of young people now are migrating to the West, um, to these urban centres, because of the innovative solutions that are occurring there, and leaving these rural areas depopulated. For Frank Bogovic, smart villages and the increasing digitalisation of rural areas is just as important as the big urban centres themselves. Okay, so I'll have to wrap up very quickly here. We've, we've uh, covered a lot of ground, I hope, to have given you a number of examples uh, as to how the solutions presented in ESPON's policy brief uh, have been presented to you. And for me, there are three main takeaways here to uh, take with you uh, into the sessions occurring for the rest of today and tomorrow. Three principles that I think we should all hold dear to ourselves. Citizens, openness, and networks. The key policy messages here are about making sure that we uh, approach the cities of tomorrow in a human-centric and a holistic way. Having the confidence and leadership to ask citizens and end users to get involved from the very beginning. Projects should, be, should operate in a spirit of openness and co-creation, adopting principles such as interoperability and open data. And finally, networks of collaboration are vitally important, be they departmental, sectoral, national or international, for levying procurement power and pooling larger data sets and areas of expertise and knowledge. If you take any messages away from the next two days, I would hope that it's these three-columned approach uh, that will help inform your policy making and your research with regards to Europe's future development of smart city infrastructure. Now, in preparation for this presentation, I read a lot. Um, and I also read tens, maybe even close to a hundred different definitions of what a smart city actually was. And I pained for hours over these different definitions. And there wasn't really one that paralleled very well with me. And then I came across one the other day that I thought was flexible enough 
um, and open enough to have us ready for the smart solutions of tomorrow, as well as being pre prepared for the urban challenges that we haven't even foreseen yet. And this definition comes from the UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and is as follows. The concept of the smart city is not static. There is no absolute definition of a smart city, no end point, but rather a process, a series of steps by which cities become more livable and resilient and hence able to respond quicker to new challenges. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your coffee break. I, I enjoyed what I had. Uh, it seemed to be, uh, avocado seems to be very popular here in Helsinki. La the last two days in a row, it's, it's been my lunch, and avocado schmorbrot or something like that. Just marvelous, though. I loved it. And the coffee wasn't bad either. I was, I was very impressed with that. Anyway, I, I hope you all enjoyed your coffee break and that you've come back uh, r relaxed and uh, rested, inspired, and, and eager to to listen and participate in this debate. My apologies for this podium that is hiding uh, me from seeing the people back there, but I, I know you're there, and I, I do want to include everybody in, in, this, dis in this discussion. Uh, it's really a great opportunity for me to be here today. I'm, I, I've decided not to waste my time during the 30 minutes I had for that pr very difficult presentation to uh, to to thank uh, Espon and the Finnish EU presidency for for hosting this event and for uh, having me come in as an outsider, as a journalist, to uh, to meet with you and discuss with you these very important issues that affect. Uh, everyone living in the European Union and arguably beyond. Um, we are now about to begin a, a discussion uh, that will touch on a wide on wide ranging issues derived from the State of the European Territory report and all issues associated with cohesion and territorial evidence and research and everything that we've been talking about already this morning, the five chapters, the, the five priorities for cohesion uh, policy or the territorial agenda. And so we're going to pick up w on some of those. We have some, some great people on our panel here to, to help us do that. And I'll introduce them very briefly, uh, starting at the far end here. We have Marco Marcola. He is the first vice president of the Committee of the Regions uh, in the European Parliament. So um, thank you very much for, for joining us here today. I know you have a busy day. You missed the presentations this morning because you're at another high-level event uh, to which you also have to return after this panel discussion. So thank you for making time for to join us here uh, today. Uh, then next to Marco, I'm going to use first names if that's okay and if we, if we could, it just makes it a bit more casual and we'll we'll make a, make quicker progress. Lambert von Nistelrooyd, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, he's a, a former member of the European Parliament himself and until just a couple of months ago, actually. Uh, he's from the Netherlands, and he's a very experienced um, politician who also has background in geography, which happens to be one of his passions and uh, which relates very well to what what the what Espon is doing, also in terms of regional expertise. He has uh, a lot of experience dealing with regional policy making in addition to working at a, at a European level, so he sees things also from both perspectives. Um, is it Johanna or Johanna? Ju Johanna, Johanna, I don't know, whatever you prefer. I, I live in Germany, so a J for me is, uh, is also J. Okay, so we'll say Johanna uh, Rautianen. Uh, a senior specialist in the Ministry of the Environment here in Finland, uh, based in Helsinki. And he works, if I understand this correctly, your policy interests don't relate just to the environment, but also to uh, urban planning and dealing with technological issues and all sorts of formulations of, of various kinds of policy. So he can also give us insights from that perspective. And of course, Ilona Rauxa, who needs no introduction, everyone here in the room <laughs> knows very well uh, that Ilona is head of the of Espan's uh, EGTC, um, which, you know, there's so many acronyms uh, associated with this whole exercise. When I was when I was preparing the presentation this morning, and I was I was working through that 
that report, I, I, I noticed that there was a, a helpful list of acronyms at the very beginning, which I, I used and referenced, but there are also numerous acronyms that I didn't know, that I had to look up, that are simply not in there. And uh, this is a, you know, when you get into this level of policymaking, things become somewhat abstract. So we're going to try to bring it down to, uh, down to earth a little bit during this next hour of the discussion. Now, before we actually start chatting, I need to draw your attention to Slido. Uh, Slido is something that mm, I guess most people in this room have already had some experience with. If you've attended previous SBON events, uh, you will know that this is our way of allowing you to interact with the discussion. Slido is um, it's an online portal that enables audience interaction with the event and it offers two possibilities uh, to participate in polls and to to put questions and to vote on those questions so we're going there is a step-by-step -step direction in your program but we're going to go through it very quickly right now with a little couple of practice questions um, if you haven't already logged into slido i encourage you to do that now and if you haven't found the Wi-Fi password for uh, for the epicenter, uh, we had it posted there this morning. Uh, but just to remind you, I believe it's digitally driven, one word with both D's capitalized. Digitally driven. Yeah, just you want to uh, log into the internet. And then log into Slido, which is super easy to do. I just did it myself. And then open, um, and then we can get started. If you if you are there, we're going to start. We're going to put up a couple of questions. Has everybody had time to get logged into that? To log into Slido, it's really just putting in the uh, Slido.com. That's a great way to uh, to find. Just go to Slido.com on your in your browser, and then it'll ask you to give a an event code, which is SPON. And once you've done that, you should be should be good to go. And we can get started with that. So if, uh, if we're ready, we're going to do a couple of test questions. I'm told that many of you have seen these test questions before. This is purely to, to, to get an idea of how to use this. So can we, can we get uh, the first one going? The first test question, let's see. Is it, oh, there it is already, good. Uh, look at that, well, my goodness, we've got 40, 50 people already logged in. You're ahead of me. You see, I'm, I'm looking at the monitors here, where, which is something completely different. So I need to turn around to see what's happening. So 56 people are already with us. The, the first question being, uh, basically, who, who are you? Um, one of these five categories. And now that we've already got up to 61, let's see what the result, oh, look at that. We've got researchers, mainly researchers today. National policymakers, well, well other stakeholders, 16. Okay, so we've got a lot of researchers and policymakers and other stakeholders. And what could that be? There's a lot of things. Oh, 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 we're getting this. Fascinating. Very well. Okay, this is really just a test, but also good for me to see what our audience uh, is is composed of. Marvelous. Okay, so we've got regional, local, and European policymakers as well. Marvelous. Okay, together with national policymakers, 29% national policymakers, 30, 30%, so a third. National policymakers. National meaning not necessarily Finnish, but perhaps, uh, perhaps so. <laughs> okay. All right. And a second question. I'm told we have a second question. Uh, and that is a question about how you feel. How do you feel about ESPON evidence to support place-based policymaking in your country or region? Great, we've got, we've got a, a, a one, one vote of great here. I feel, I feel good. <laughs> okay, are you informed and inspired? Just informed, just inspired, or simply curious? We have 62 responses already, this is great. You guys are, are pros at this, aren't you? You've done this before. And if you've answered the same question, I'm wondering, you know, how many, the question I would like to ask is how many of you answered the same question the same way each time, or do you, do you change your answer at each event? <laughs> okay. So let us see, let's see the results here. We've got informed and inspired by 43%, that's very good. Informed and curious, and so only inspired six, but informed and inspired. So we've got a predominance of being informed and inspired, and then informed, marvelous. And cur curious, I'm glad to see that 20% of curious. Curiosity uh, is what drives all of this, isn't it? what makes my work so interesting. Um, so 
moving right along. So we've got that worked out now. And as you know, as we're discussing, if you have a question, you can put it on the Slido yourself. There's a, there are two options there, one for the polls and one for questions. And with the questions, the interesting part is that you can vote on other people's questions. So if you see a question there that makes a lot of sense to you and you would like that to actually get asked at the end of the session, um, please do vote for it. It could be your own. You can vote for your own. So you can kind of rig the system a little bit. But uh, you, if you, the questions that float to the top will be the ones that will pro most likely get asked at the end of the session. I'd like to leave about 15 or 20 minutes towards the end for input from, the, from Slido. Good. Um, so is that, I'm, this is my first Slido presentation for, okay, we're good to go. All right. So Slido is clarified. Um, we've introduced everyone. I've introduced myself earlier this morning. I don't need to say anything more about me. Um, if you're wondering where I'm from, by the way, I'm originally from Canada. I lived in Canada. I uh, was born there, lived 17 years there, then lived in the U.S. and moved to Germany 30 years ago. So I've been in Berlin for 30 years. That's, uh, that's my biography. All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, thank you all again for, for being with us. Um, I know you, you have different schedules and um, pressing, pressing things to do. The, what I'd like to talk about today is not just the report, but I'd like to talk about the report that I introduced this morning, uh, which most of you were able to, to follow. I would ask, Mark, Mark did, have you had a chance to look at that report, to take a, take a look at it? Yeah, very good. So that, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, as, as it were, because I, I, would, I would start with you uh, in terms of putting, putting out my question, and we can, I can have you all comment on that. And um, that is just a, a general comment, since you all have seen the report, you understand what's in it. I would just like to ask you if there is anything in that in that report that uh, that struck you. The wh what do you think the, the value, the added value of that report is? How do you think it's going to to be used, and how might it inform your own work moving forward? Okay, um, thank you, and thank you for inviting me here. But for that, so let me just say two things. So first, uh, this uh, European Committee of the Region. So. We are actually part of the EU official uh, decision making. We, our 350 members from all parts of Europe, so mayors, regional presidents, councils, we go regularly to Brussels. Next week is our plenary day, three days there in the decisions concerning all of these uh, EU key issues. And our perspective is strongly on what does this mean for cities and regions. So urban development, but of course digitalization, all related to that, so they are very high on our agenda. And uh, the other thing, so that I've uh, qu quite often uh, uh, seen as an ambassador of ESPO, not necessarily ESPO yet at least, so because ESPO, the, the next city attached to Helsinki, part of the metropolitan area, so that is ESPO practically written the, the same way, only the last letter is different. And I'm there, the chair of the board, so I'm the political decision maker, both uh, regional and city level and then the European Union. So it was a bit hard to put which uh, priority in the first uh, question, how to answer to that, but then seeing this and from that, so then uh, comes my key point so that we definitely need much more evidence, evidence supported, not, not always evidence uh, based decisions because Politicians want to have a certain freedom, but if we have the, the key uh, knowledge there uh, at, at the back, so that is crucial, and that's why the work of ESPON is so crucial. Do you, are you saying we need more evidence, or we need more evidence-informed policymaking? Yeah, we need more evidence-informed or evidence-supported policymaking. We have a lot of the information here, but if we link this so that there is a lot of capacity in the, the local level, regional level, which is in the, in the heads of uh, decision makers as well. But that's not very effectively used. So practically what we need, we need more learning. And then when I link this to the, let's say, sustainable development goals, all those 17 SDGs, so which are strong in our priority in Finland, so how to implement, how to help the rest of the world. So there we need this knowledge. And that comes very clearly through the on different reports, but 
then when I just took one of those, the digital innovation in urban environment, looked what do you say here? So, uh, so you said moving beyond the smart city. So it's not anymore just uh, having the technology that is available, but it's how we implement, how we have the influence, impact, and w that is something where ne we need to focus much, much more. And then this comes learning of the politicians as well. So I'm personally really a strong lifelong learner throughout my side. Now, now when finally retiring, so I think hopefully I now have enough time to write my own dissertation. So being a researcher as well. So focusing a bit on these lessons learned. So we all should do more of that in our local or regional or European level activity. And on that, so with the ESPON, we should find new ways how to how to operate with this. And this, we have a lot of good practice now with the Committee of the Regions in our collaboration with Joint Research Center. And so we have started a lot of activities, thanks partly to Lambert van Nisteroy, uh, Science Meet Parliament in Brussels, but we have organized a lot of piloting activities, Science Meet Regions. Okay, we, So we that's a good point. Very good. Um, I, I want to come back to the idea about uh, transferring this knowledge or in getting this evidence integrated into the policymaking process, which is a, a, a big challenge as well. I hope that'll come out uh, more later in our discussion. Um, Lambert van Nistelrooy, uh, you have just heard one take on, on what is needed in terms of the evidence, but getting back specifically to this, to this report, um, because I'm curious about this, having invested quite a bit of time myself now in, in, uh, in trying to understand this report and to see what its added value is. Uh, where do you see this report being used? Thank you very much for having the opportunity here to think you, with you, a former member of the parliament, and I will be very direct. I think this is essential information at an essential moment in European development. But exactly what was said in the beginning, the new era for ESPON, it's how it's taken on board. And there we have a huge op opportunity. Coming from the period that we had the crisis uh, and the post-crisis period with a lot of measures that were taken, uh, let me say, how did you say it? Location blind. You remember? The Juncker plan, the big investments, a lot of things, and it might uh, change Europe as a whole. But at this, at that stage, they didn't look to the effects in the rural areas, or they didn't go deep. Now that we are out of that period, and uh, partly recovering, and looking to ourselves in the worldwide position of Europe, is exactly this message that can come up. Today, uh, European Parliament uh, will agree the new commission. And if you look into the new commission and you see the portfolios, something changed. Something changed. The commissioner, Mr. Ferreira, for regional policy and cohesion and urban policy, she is connected directly in her portfolio with structural changes. It's not just giving the money for cities and, and, and member states to develop or whatever, to make innovation happen, but also to find the, 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 the necessary changes in the next years combined. And the other way, you have Mrs. Gabriel, who is doing Horizon 2020. She has already said that she wants to have a territorial um, impact of her work. Horizon 2020 and all the frameworks before were free floating intelligence. Of course, bringing the best professors together. So at this stage, and this is the, when I was reading this report, I thought, wow. It's more about how it's taken on board. And maybe in the next two years, it's 2020, when the negotiations are uh, finalized, as I already said, your report at the end of next year, and 2021, 2022, the years of the first implementation. And there should be a valorization of what you are doing. So I can't wait to give you the higher level. And I have a listening ear because members of the parliament, you saw Mr. Bogovic for the smart villages, are all coming from a part of Germany. 
or a part of uh, Italy, a part of, so they have the local and the regional impact and interest, political interest and content-wise interest I in their body. So you can have a much better um, path of debating, and maybe we have to talk about that. This was my feeling. Very good, thank you. Um, that already gets us going quite far, I think. When we're talking about the report, of course, we're talking about not just the report, that's just a document. But the doc This document distills two years of research and more uh, that is directed at cohesion policy and the territorial agenda. Ilona, I'm gonna come back to you at the end of this, right? I'm gonna let you uh, comment after we've heard from you, Hane Rautianen. Uh, if you would like to comment on, on follow up on what the other two speakers have just said regarding the value of what this report represents and where it might, how it might be useful. Well, thanks, Terry, for this uh, question. And uh, let me tell you, uh, I've had my third cup of Finnish coffee this morning and I'm very excited <laughs> to be here, almost too excited, let's see. But uh, about on this report, and what it distills, and, and the previous talkers mentioned that as education, and uh, we also need this uh, development uh, in all areas, all territories, the countryside embedded in, in all policy uh, on the EU level, that and we have um, the progress in all areas and territories. And uh, I'd like to mention a few key points that really I noted from the report that are very important to achieve this in, in Europe is are that um, we need uh, very, very serious policy on, on interoperability and uh, open data and open codes when we develop uh, new public systems or, or different digital systems for um, human-centric needs. And uh, in, in Finnish regulation, we already have this deep by default, all this, uh, that it has, that, uh, these, these have to be interoperable. They have to be open, and it's not a coincidence that Finland has this because, uh, if you may know, um, a Finnish person named Linus Turvalds was the first one to um, publish um, the Linux kernel to start the development of the Linux system, the e whole ecosystem of open source uh, development in, in computer ICT technologies. So. Um, th this is one, one key point. And um, another thing I, I really think, considering how to develop the countryside and, and uh, the ones uh, sort of side, well, during the Finnish presidency, digitalization has been very important subjects for us. And it has become evident to me that in Europe, we actually face a digital divide. And uh, in Finland, we also face a digital divide, whether it be between generations or different um, uh, people with different backgrounds in education or skills, and um, to, to counter this digital divide, I, I feel in the future we need uh, digital cohesion. And, and this has not yet been mentioned much, but maybe digital cohesion might be, might be something. And, and to, for digital cohesion, it's very important what it says in the report. We need uh, physical, but also digital connectivity and infrastructures in place to not only help that the striving cities go ahead, but for the, the imitators or, or the late adopters of new technologies to adopt easier. And, and this comes to my first point again, why interoperability and, and open data and open systems is so important is that it really makes it easier for the late adopters to catch up and take on board these new technologies that we are developing. Good. Ilona? This, yes. is, this is the fruition of your, your work, right? <laughs> yes, don't scare me too much <laughs> <laughs> about this. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, uh, we believe uh, this report is uh, one key achievement of uh, the ESPAN program because it indeed uh, synthesizes the messages coming out of all our fresh evidence uh, and, and the latest uh, research results uh, that we have. And uh, this probably is also the right moment uh, for me to say a very big thank you to the research team and also to our own project expert at Espony GTC, Michaela, who was also uh, working uh, hard <laughs> to make sure that uh, 
this report is uh, of high quality and delivered on time uh, to all of you uh, as, as uh, uh, our seminar participants. Uh, I would like to highlight one key message that is the red thread of the report, the horizontal key uh, point that we would like to convey with this report. And I very much hope that you did uh, um, kind of feel it, that you did notice it, that it really uh, is something that is obvious and evident, is that future policymaking approach should change. And it should change towards promoting more territorial cooperation at the scale of functional geographies. So more functional approach, more territorial cooperation are the two key messages, horizontal messages of this report. Uh, it's like a, already sounds like an old song of, of Ilona, but I will continue with this message as long as I can. <laughs> because this indeed is something that has to be made a very strong principle of the policy making around Europe nowadays. Uh, policy making within administrative borders don't fly anymore, is not relevant anymore, does not address the needs of people anymore sufficiently because people don't live uh, within the borders. They have their daily lives very much linked to geographies that uh, span across the, the administrative borders. And this is why policymaking, if we really claim that policymaking should become closer to the needs of the citizens, it should transform. Now, my challenge is how to promote this revolution. By my challenge, I mean the challenge of ESPON as a program. How to promote this revolutionary approach towards more policy development, new investment practices, new governance solutions at different functional scales beyond administrative borders. It's much easier to say it than to implement it, and we know it. So who should be the leader? Who should, who should be the supporter? Who should be the driver of this revolution is a key question. Can we promote it with just one report? Well, of course not. Uh, we need to mobilize important players and stakeholders to make sure that they uh, become very active leaders in this process. And here, because we're talking uh, and, and thinking about uh, borderless policy making, I think European institutions, European programs, everybody who is working at, at a European scale in different uh, functions and roles has uh, a key uh, role to play uh, in this process. And here I'm looking at the Committee of the Regions, at the European Parliament, at the European Commission, also EU programs like ESPON, uh, like uh, URBACT, like uh, all other kinds of European territorial cooperation programs. There should, there should be a drive, a very strong drive towards uh, this approach to support national governments to support regions, to support cities uh, in implementing this new approach. Because we, as you know, probably there are plenty of good practice examples around Europe when the, where this is already happening, but it's not sufficient. We need to mainstream this approach and therefore there should be a very strong push and drive for it. And it should come from the European level. This is at least my understanding, correct me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and, pr and programs like ESPON, of course, have a very important contribution to make with all our evidence that we are developing, with all the capacity building activities that we can deliver already and that we will deliver um, much stronger also in, uh, and we promote them in, in the future programming uh, period. But it is a revolution that will not happen just like that. It has to be very actively promoted in all kinds of uh, ways. And uh, we, from our side, from ESPON side, with reports like that, with the discussions, uh, working directly with our stakeholders, uh, supporting their policy development, we do play a role, we have our contribution, but uh, my point is that this is not sufficient and European institutions also have to become very active uh, in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have an introduction uh, to our, our topic, and I'd like to go a little deeper with that. What's come from what I from our discussion so far, at least from three of you, 
it's very much not it's very much the idea of turning this evidence into policy and putting the policy into practice uh, and we have a very specific uh, topical approach that you were describing in terms of digital uh, connectivity, digital cohesion uh, was the, the term you put on it, which I think is a, a, a nice one, uh, which we can maybe get into in more uh, more concrete e examples of that uh, with respect to Finland, which where, where you were working. Um, so I would put the question again, going back to the to the beginning to Marco Marcola, because you have experience quite a bit, and you're still you're still active as vice president of the committee of the regions, um, that you talk to us a bit about how you see the capacity, the administrative capacity uh, at different levels in the chain, in the policy chain. The administrative capacity and the political will to take this evidence, to take the policies uh, proposals that are put together on the basis of this evidence and implement it. What do you see there in terms of administrative capacity and political will? Is it there? Um, let me come to that uh, very simply from what Ilona just pointed out, so that we need more of this horizontal uh, action and, and so, so the understanding. So what the, the ESPON reports very clearly show that it's, it's very useful for us at the local and regional level to, to understand based on that, so where we are, kind of benchmarking. But uh, then when we come to the use of the capacity so when, again, uh, linking this on the SDGs, so all those 17 sustainable development goals, so practically at least two-thirds of them or the actions inside them, when we look on the all 169 more concrete uh, indicators inside those what the UN and global research communities have showed up, so the two-thirds of them are practically implemented at the local level local and then I mean the whole region and there we come to this this point so that we need to move to the from benchmarking to bench learning first so that what does it mean and it's very often that inside Europe now what is clearly here in the report as well the in importance of smart specialization so we have these regional strategies focusing on a few key areas where the action should more and more be for economic transformation. And economic transformation is for sustainable growth and learning from the others. So regions who share the same strong interests, so they should do much more on this kind of collaborative learning. Again, evidence-based, evidence-supported. And then uh, don't stop there on the learning, but move to action. And that's why in the I'm as well uh, uh, a bit more than a week from now, they're going to Madrid for this uh, uh, climate uh, negotiations, several seminars there where we more and more we share the actions. What are we doing? How we can many cities, regions be forerunners, kind of showing to the others and supporting the others as well. And there we again come to this capacity. We have a huge capacity in Europe alone, uh, and that capacity is very much on the local and regional level. But when we talk about cities or this regional level, so it's not uh, not that much about the authorities, but it's when talking of cities, so it's different uh, communities, communities of practice there, um, schools, universities, industrial arts and sports, and their combination. And that's why, again, coming strongly from the report, these regional innovation ecosystems, because they're both on the thematic issues, but on the more broader horizontal issues so the, uh, the people, actors collaborate with each other and share them the results uh, for better impact, better influence throughout the whole Europe. And that's what we need to do more. Okay, so you have identified where you see a need for more learning, uh, not just you know, benchmarking, but benchmark uh, learning, I, th I think is the way, way you put it, but and you also described uh, different efforts to try to uh, to uh, enhance that capacity. But I'm, I'm, a little cu I'm very curious to hear what you, as a very experienced politician uh, at different levels of governance, uh, from you know, local or regional on up to the European level, 
what your experience is in recent years, having, you, you know ESPON, you know the work that ESPON is doing, and, and ESPON's not the only one doing this kind of, kind of work, there are other, others as well. You're a researcher yourself, you have, you know, lifelong learning has been one of your, your, your passions. As you've co-authored a book on dissemination uh, that uh, also deals with knowledge transfer to some degree or how to communicate results. What's your impression of how things have evolved in recent years with respect to the uptake of the kind of evidence that ESPON and others are producing addressing these cohesion challenges from a territorial perspective? Just, it's a big it question, is, yeah, I realize but that. It's, but it's really a, a, a major challenge all the time. But that means that we are not, uh, we should not think about the individuals alone, but learning is more and more nowadays teams, team learning with a shared vision. So we organize that and we meet more. And so we need to have this face-to-face -face events, but we are using networks, uh, digital networks more and more. So to find the, the new, let's say data, and that's where we come to what Johanna said so strongly so that we need to take the digitalization more active active use. And there's much what at the EU level, uh, DigiGrow uh, has found a very good way how to support the cities. They called uh, a couple of years ago, us through the re Committee of the Region as well, so uh, uh, kind of forerunner cities who want to learn themselves, not providing money directly, but providing mentoring, uh, f having best experienced people and then called co mm. got close to 100 uh, cities saying that, okay, we want to be part of this city digital challenge. And so, and so it, it really worked a lot because then people were learning throughout the process through the action that they implemented immediately in their own cities. So there are good examples, there are positive examples, but uh, again, coming back to my question, and forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist, uh, but the, you know, the, my, what I'm curious about is what you observe as a pattern or a trend in terms of political will and administrative capacity to take up this material. Uh, is, there, is it growing? Is it static? Is it facing a kind of challenge that it simply it can't it be is overcome? Definitely it is growing, but more I see is really so that we need it, we should uh, speed up. So uh, again, in the table of the decision making, there should be these let's say basic facts and figures, put them on table, spend an hour or so in a meeting just to agree on the data, what we have there, and then, okay, what is then the next steps, how to find the new solutions? Okay. So uh, it's speeding up, but we should move much, much faster when we look at the climate or the other, other SDGs as well. So there is need for not only social innovations or technological innovation, but kind of societal innovations where the the, the lawmaking or others are part of that, so again, speeding up this uh, transformation. Okay, uh, would anyone else like to comment on that particular question that I just put out? Because uh, it is so fundamentally important. Um, so I'd just like to open the, open the panel. Yeah, go right ahead. Take, taking uh, up um, Makula's remarks, I think it's important to have the feeling of the moment Europe is in. Um, as I said before, but it can it means that there has to be an agreement between the member states and the union, and this is done in the regulations, for instance, on the structural policies and other fields, on the Green Deal, uh, if, by which it is multi-level governance. If we don't do that, if a member state says, okay, I get the European money or support, but I do it in my own way and I don't care about and this is extremely important that in the upcoming negotiations, these days there are the negotiations, that we have this partnership agreement by which the uh, Europe ministers, the national ministers, sign on these targeted goals. And they say, okay, not for one program, but for, it's for seven years. In 2024, a midterm evaluation, a serious evaluation on where we stand. And this is extremely important. And you see the tendency that some of the member states say, this is bureaucracy. What's this? The, the, the simplification, man. What kind of world do you live in? And exactly this is what I mean. Because this gives trust both to the cities, to the public side, but also 
to the private side that comes in, the banks, etc. If you change your policy every year, two, three years after a new election in Romania, this, this can be done. So there is, in my opinion, and I made a booklet, talk about booklets on the multi-level governance, this is essential for the next, uh, next time to come, and there we take on board this human capacity. This is not just training your civil servants. This is the method that you use on this innovation ecosystems, and as we see in the report, a lot of these things. So the instruments are there, but Europe should not float apart with the nationalist movements that are going on now. And this has nothing to do with, with political direction, but uh, you do it on the content. And here, this is not a question of new um, treaties or, or things. It's more like we did in the Pact of Amsterdam for the urban development. It's about your contribution from your part of, of, of the country that you bring to the European goals. This is the point. It's not exactly whether you are a full rest, a federalistic state with, 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 with German lender, uh, or you are just a city in a, in, a, in, in a unitarian state like Luxembourg or Netherlands. So it's more about what do you bring in these changes that we need. And this is, this is more an evolution, I must say. I'm not the one of the revolution, but maybe we can agree on that later. <laughs> Let me just start to learn more <laughs> by reading, looking your book, so that there is a good example of kind of spiral uh, influence. So, and Lambert is writing here, Espon gives an example of cooperative multi-level governance. The silo mentality must be replaced by a continuous cooperative multi-level governance system. So focusing more and learning together again. And so making this in a concrete firm to be so very good, uh, so that you document that as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Terry. Um, I'd like to reflect to the previous speakers, and indeed, we, I, I agree we need more multi-level governance. It's very key. And I think uh, the EU should do more to uh, incentivize this multi-level governance and cross-border, cross-cooperation, co-creation, everything. Um, breaking the silo mentality is very important. It's a prerequisite for innovation. And uh, unless we... we we have to have like some sort of regulatory framework that helps this. We have monetary incentives, and uh, somehow um, in innovation, uh, economy development, uh, it, it often feels that if we give all the money to the forerunners, we will be world class. Of course, Europe wants to be world class, but if we, for if we forget all the others on the way, we'll end up with Silicon Valleys that we don't necessarily provide solutions for all Europeans. So, so countering this and then breaking the silo mentality and then multi-level governance is very key. It should be more in the regulations, I, I feel. Ilona, any, any comments? We can move straight along. I've, I've got lots of questions here, of course. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to get a little bit more concrete um, and talk about just two, two aspects of the, the priorities for the upcoming uh, post-2020 the formulation of post-2020 cohesion policy and for the, the territorial agenda. And those and these are key priorities, not just at a European level, but also for countries, including uh, Finland and, and the Netherlands. Uh, so on the question of, of digital transition, this is something that's already been raised here, of talking about digital cohesion, how to, how to move along in that direction, also to, to pr promote cohesion. And in terms of, of a greener Europe, of achieving the uh, achieving the sustainable development goals, but also the the, the green greener Europe part of that. Those two aspects. When we're talking about the greener Europe, and we're talking about the, the digital connectivity in Europe, where do you see uh, those two policy chapters in terms of the priorities that are operating both at the at the at the you know, national level and at the European level, but also to some degree at the, at the region level. Because I know that in Finland, for example, uh, you have s these sparsely populated regions, and you have uh, you know, this whole question about how do you not leave the countryside behind while continue to develop the, the cities is a big question. So I'd like to hear your comments on those two particular chapters. How, how do you see evidence feeding into that that's going to support cohesion moving forward? Very, very broad question, but you can approach it from wh whatever direction fits your experience best. 
maybe Elono, how do you see what, what, in terms of what ESPON has produced, where do you see the potential for that to be taken up the most? Oh, it's fine. It's fine. I, I can start. Yeah, you, 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 Terry, you mentioned Finland. and well, Actually, I've also lived a large part of my life in Canada, so oh, really? we have that in common. But uh, you've never lived in Finland, but you know much about it, I, I, I see. And uh, indeed, um, the map also shown today uh, showed Finland very blue, as in uh, digital connectivity. And, and of course, we had this Nokia. And Nokia was a product because we are actually sparsely populated and to connect people in sparsely populated areas is very more efficient to develop um, wireless connections instead of wired connections. Now currently uh, concerning future policy and broadband connections uh, in the countryside, uh, we know um, that it's not only enough to have these wireless connections, they're wonderful and I can work in my countryside uh, at my cottage every day like on my laptop and it's it's really nice but but for certain industries for certain solutions for um, faster uh, connectivity you need wired connections and this is where the CEF uh, facility uh, connecting Europe is very important to actually develop hardwired uh, connectivity also to different regions not only uh, wireless so you know this is also even in Germany many people think oh Germany rich country, you know, very industrialized, very powerful. But there are parts of Germany where there is no connectivity. Uh, it's also just a, a, a blank space, uh, particularly in the, in the east and parts of the north. So this, uh, and again, this, uh, this impacts business, uh, all kinds of development, uh, also a participation in public life. What, um, so we've talked about, you, you've mentioned digitization and how digital connectivity, uh, but I'm on the question of how that relates to cohesion, how is this going to be, how, how is this goal that you would have uh, can be transferred into policy on the basis of the research that has been, that's been produced in this area? Because this is a challenge for everyone and everyone recognizes how important this is. Uh, so do we see progress being made in this area? And if so, how? Comments? A very short comment, yeah. I mean, in, in practice, we see that it's not enough only to provide like uh, broadband connections. You also have to develop the industries and the mentalities of the people receiving these connections that they actually are put to use and at full capacity. And oftentimes, uh, thinking about the new cohesion policy period, I, fe I, I hear this uh, debate that what's the point of putting broadband connection in countryside? because no one there is using it or they don't have the skills or the industries or the, the uh, enterprises to uh, actually put it to good use. So it's a waste of money. But this is where we come to the silo mentality. So if we cr break the silo mentality and develop the skills and industries in these areas while bringing the connectivity up, then you get uh, synergies and then society will benefit as a whole. And then we maybe to complement what Johanna was just saying, and again to highlight the message uh, in our policy brief on the digitalization, yeah. um, people-centered approach is what is very important here as well. And relating the digitalization uh, policy to the real needs of the people and helping to address these needs is something that should be at the heart of, of this. It's not about, as we heard, in the morning, it's not about technology-driven change. It's not about technology for whatever. It's about the people's needs. It's about why, are we, what are we doing it for, and whom are we doing it for, and and at the same time, digitalization is also, and here I come back again to my to my first message. Digitalization is also again uh, a tool, one of the policy directions that also helps you to address things beyond borders, to address different. Uh, development uh, patterns to sort out different issues uh, beyond borders uh, to develop cross-border uh, public services for example right uh, this is just one example that that also where digitalization plays a very uh, important role so uh, promoting this change towards um, a policy that is closer to the needs of the people digitalization in that regard is also a very key uh, a very key policy direction 
a great, uh, this is a great way of uh, transition into some of the questions that we've already gotten from the audience. And even though we didn't get very far uh, on anything to do with green stop, we, uh, we, are, we are talking more about digitaliz digitalization today. But maybe one comment about uh, become making a greener Europe. The circular so you, economy. You, you both brought it to the vast um, rural areas in Finland. But look to Europe. Look to the population shifts half Europe is affected by this fundamental citizens oriented approach. If, if the citizens go and the younger people leave and don't come back, you can talk to the citizens, but okay, the the the, the, the greener economy, the, digi the, the, the circular economy has a, has a big opportunity in the rural areas. Because if we talk about this this, this the environmental um, the ecosystem in which the farmers, in which uh, the energy production, in which the uh, the consumers, in which uh, education systems, uh, the schools should be uh, connected. There is a vast opportunity. We did not really start yet. We have had a lot of projects, a lot of pilots in Europe, where we see that villages can be very proud if they get the opportunity and the rest of possibility to, to change in that direction of a new energy, um, non-fossil uh, production. But this is also a question of regulation. There the member states have their hands with the big uh, producing companies that won't give them the possibility. So here again, it's not looking and say, you are, I want to empower you in your village and regulation stop them. And there, there's again the multi-level governance in which we say, yes, what is the next 20 years for the, for the rural areas? How is it? This is now higher on the political agenda too, at all the levels. People are not glad with these nationalistic, with the populistic new movements throughout Europe. People say we are not connected anymore. Is this the Europe that promises something, that is promised after the fall of the wall? You know, no, it is in that direction. And there I touch you. And there the smart villages approach can be as important as the uh, Pact of Amsterdam and the, uh, the development on, on, on the urban ecosystem. So I want to be there. And politically, if you see the text of von der Leyen uh, for the new commission, this attention is there. But it is a big lack of content, a big lack of methods to make it happen, and there you can jump in. I think this is the point. My last remark on that, uh, I was there when we changed the Lisbon Treaty, the treaty, and there we brought the territorial goal of the Union in, with three Cs. I made a report in the Parliament in 2008. It is, yes, we say yes to concentration, because it has to be done somewhere if you want to compete in the world and be Europe in the future. But on the condition of connection and cooperation. And here these two, these two other seas are not filled in in a way that should be done if we need more speed, the speed we need. So there you have to look and say, what is the step, what are the steps that we can uh, use and what the content that you brought, this citizens oriented approach, I think this is, both politically necessary, it felt with the new commission, but it is a lack of how to do it. And we have to, to jump in. The cap, the agricultural policy will be revised one or two years later than the, than the, the cohesion policy. There we have a big opportunity, absolutely. The second pillar of the, uh, uh, of the, 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 the agricultural policy can touch these kind of things, not just giving some more money to the farmers. It's, it's another piece of cake. Okay, connection and, and uh, cooperation. We need more of that. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, I do want to get some of the audience uh, input in here because uh, it was promised at the beginning and I, I'm very, uh, you know, I, I need to deliver on that. Um, what, we, what I would like to hear more about in the last 10 minutes that we have for the talk is the idea of, of a functional approach that looks beyond borders. Now, you, you, we talked about a, a pan-European approach that considers uh, concentration, cooperation, Etc. cetera, uh, we've talked about different challenges like uh, connectivity w in, in rural areas, uh, but I would love to, to think more about crossing borders and how this evidence can, can help 
uh, do that. So let's look at what we've got in terms of questions. Um, maybe we can put this on the, on the screen. We can see what we have so far. Everyone can just see it on their own devices. Uh, the question that has got the most votes so far uh, is concerning the whole smart concept. What is smart? Um, is it only about digitalization? We heard the idea of a smart city uh, being questioned today, just what that is. We know there are many definitions, but um, the one question that's got the most votes up there, it's about appropriate governance. Is it really is it perhaps more about governance and efficient use of available knowledge and resources? So we're getting back to the governance question and how resources are allocated. Would anyone like to comment more on that in terms of what is smart and what role is digitization playing in that as opposed to governance? Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, yeah, smart should be understood in a broad sense, and I, I understand this question, and um, it's not only about digitalization. As we have said, stated in our policy brief that we tendered from Espon is that digital uh, solutions are only a means to achieve smartness. And um, we, we have had like serious talk about smart cities, but I think we should have more talk about smart society. And Smart society has to do with all, all, all pillars of society, whether it be health services, governance, mechanisms, funding, investments, enterprise, everything should be smart. No one wants to be dumb, of course, <laughs> or um, idiot. Uh, idiot cities, no, we don't want that. But yeah, this smartness uh, is a vague, vague, vague thing. And, um, but it's doing the right thing to all the people, I'd say. And it's, it's being constantly redefined, as, as we learn, too. Ilona, um, I do want to get you in here, because the, the question is now topping the agenda. Maybe it's getting, getting some more votes as we speak. Um, but it's a question that you are confronted with all the time, and that is the whole outreach question with what ESPON is doing. So I would um, put that to you. I know you, you've commented on that already, the need for, for more of that. Uh, it, it's built into the needs of ESPON. It's, I was looking at how ESPON is described by the European Commission in its own glossary of programs and institutions. And it is mentioned, even in the 10 sentences that's described there, the challenge of trying to achieve this outreach. Uh, how, how are you approaching that? You mentioned already that like, getting people like myself to come in from the outside and talk about it more. Um, how do you see, how is that going? Yes, indeed, this is a key challenge for us to uh, promote learning, uh, to promote knowledge development on the basis of the evidence that uh, we produce. Um, we definitely cannot do it only with our publications. Our publications is also just a starting point uh, and one tool that helps us to communicate our messages, but also here in our outreach strategy, we should follow uh, a people-centered <laughs> approach. Uh, we should need, uh, we need people, we need all of you, as I mentioned in my opening speech, we need our army, our troops, that we call the ESPON family, you all playing different roles, either as a policy maker or, or as a researcher or as a contact point or as a journalist, uh, to really and you are our key network that we want to have informed, sufficiently updated, uh, and also uh, inspired to go out there in the world and to communicate these messages to, to, to the people. So uh, this is one very important aspect, is that we need our network that is behind and around the key structures of the ESPON program, that is the, the managing authority, the EGTC, and, and, and other players. We need all our networks of stakeholders to keep them mobilized and keep them informed and give them also all the necessary tools and information that they can use to then communicate the messages. Another important element, I think, and also a continuous challenge for us is to reach out to the decision makers, the, the people who are making the decisions on the different policies. Um, we have established very good collaboration with uh, at the expert level, with all of you, with other people working at national, regional, local level. They're very actively engaged as our stakeholders. 
but we do need to work more with uh, the politicians. Uh, another challenge uh, is for us to be able to reach out to local and regional level, uh, which makes our outreach exercise even more exciting and challenging at the same time because we have thousands of players we're talking about here as well. Uh, we have to be able to communicate preferably in their own national languages. And yes. uh, this is also an additional aspect that we need to consider. That's right. So that's another, that's another point uh, to, uh, for us to, to think about. And we also have some solutions for, uh, for the next uh, years. But in principle, I believe that the best way how to promote this learning is to help people to meet and learn from each other from each other on the basis of their own experiences um, uh, and uh, on the basis of the ESPON evidence and its findings. So within ESPON, we have to find new ways how to help people meet. This is why I was also advocating promoting this peer learning approach because this is a very good approach and methodology that helps people to learn from each other. And I think uh, learning from your uh, the experiences of your peers is uh, the most efficient method that can also promote learning and we will definitely be um, uh, will definitely be uh, engaging more in this type of uh, activity so promoting direct communication direct exchange I am a fan of digitalization but certain learning processes still have to be physical thank you so there's the there's the push part coming from ESPON, trying to increase the outreach. We talked at the very beginning about administrative capacity and political will. There we're talking about poll to some degree. Is there, is there, you know, is, is there poll coming? Well, while we're talking about all of that, we're seeing increasing fragmentation in Europe. And well, this is reflected in, in, political, in the political sphere as well, uh, where you have fringe parties that are beginning to uh, grow on both sides of the political spectrum. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, what, how, how to counter that trend of fragmentation, uh, doing what we, what ESPON is doing with this kind of research, this evidence-based learning, this evidence-based policy making. What potential do you see for that in the coming post 2020 period in light of this? of this movement towards fragmentation? It's a question we're, we're never going to answer right here. But um, it's something I'm going to leave in the room. Um, I say this at the very end, sorry, just as a comment, maybe a quick comment, a very quick comment from each of you because we have a family photo that we need to get organized here uh, and that's gonna take about five minutes. So if you each have just a one minute uh, statement that you can make rounding this thing up, what would you see, like to see most in the post-2020 planning period with respect to uh, of the uh, the kind of evidence that ESPON is, is bringing into this. What would you like to see, how do you, would you like to see that reflected most in the this new planning period? If you, it could be an abstract thing or it could be a concrete thing. Just one point though, if you could, very quickly. Okay, I, I will start because uh, uh, the, what we need more so that, uh, what we stressed heavily by the Committee of the Research, that every city, every village, every country can be a forerunner. So because in foreigner mentality, we stress that the kind of sympathy between the people, curiosity, entrepreneurial mindset, so that people themselves feel that they are having an influence and impact. Something valuable for themselves and on then, so EU money flow as well, cohesion policy is not a separate uh, uh, issue for, for uh, financing some project, but it's changing the mentality. And I think this mentality change is that's the key. The most important for me is people, the citizens in the center, take them serious, use everything with the big data, with the connectivity, etc. This is the, the basic point. My second point is that I see all these outcomes of ESPON as the fuel, but you should inject the fuel in the right engines and not just repeating. And what, what I see is, for instance, in this report, 77 annexes or, or references and are 44 coming from ESPON. There are 23 coming from European Commission. We from ESPON think that ESPON thinking is correct. Why don't you say 
it, it, stop it now. Look to the OECD. Look to the worldwide changes. Look how we positionate Europe in this point. Wow, didn't you see the Espon outcome? The other way around. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very good piece of advice. Um, then uh, my key message from all of this is that uh, we will have to engage more resources, make additional effort and a much stronger effort uh, to promote this thinking for more territorial cooperation functional areas. And here I'm looking back again at uh, all the people working at the European level, uh, that we need them, we need their support, we need really to encourage this borderless thinking, borderless policy making, because it does bring a number of uh, benefits and we need to be able together, working together at a European level in the framework of European programs, uh, with the European institutions, with very important uh, associations of regional local uh, authorities uh, to promote this approach, make it much stronger in the future. You get the last word. Yeah, thanks. Um, indeed, if one dream for ESPON in the future program um, I would say more implementation, more actions, more results. Inspire, uh, the, the point of ESPON is to inspire policy making. Now, it does that, we have all the data, we know all the challenges, climate change being the most serious one. Let's start acting like we want to, to achieve results and implement what we need to. Let's start acting. That's a great way to, to end this. This has been a marvelously informative discussion for me, um, and I hope it has been for the people in the audience. Thank you all for participating through Slido, for injecting your, your thoughts into this as well. Uh, I hope we can you can take the ideas that we've heard this morning, both in our panel discussion and in the two presentations and in the speeches before that, and take them into the parallel sessions, the various workshops that are going to hap here, happen here over the next two days. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to be with you this morning. Uh, I hope to see you, see you all again. I wish you well with your work, and I, I can only um, pray that, that Europe uh, does find a way of maintaining its cohesion as we move forward, not just Europe, but much of the world. That's, uh, that's what we can all uh, subscribe to, I'm sure. Okay, um, so that, first of all, a warm round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. And now we have the family picture. The family picture is about to happen uh, in this part of the room. That means that all the people on that side of the room behind these posts need to move to this side of the room and find your somewhere to stand or sit uh, all of the empty chairs here can be filled with people, and the rest can can be can find your space somewhere on those steps up there. That would be ideal. But we need to get everyone to this side of the room and try to pose for our marvelous photographer here today. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Greener, no, Low Carbon Europe uh, workshop at this uh, beautiful ESPON conference. And um, I just want to let you know that uh, I'm going to be moderating this. I, my name is David Evers, and I work at the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And that is uh, a similar institute, I think, to ESPON in the sense that we also work in this interface between science and policy. And today at the workshop, we're really going to see this in action because we're going to have this presentation of ESPON findings in, uh, first, and then we're going to have a panel discussion where two of the researchers will be on the panel and two policymakers. And we'll see then, let's say, some pi science policy interface in action. Um, and uh, I think this is also a very interesting topic in the sense that it's uh, very politically charged. It's very easy to do the math and say this is what we need to do to achieve our targets, but actually implementing those targets uh, entails many times a very real political risk. And so it'd be very interesting to see uh, people's thoughts on this as well, how you actually take the evidence and do something with the evidence if that also entails uh, 
putting your neck out uh, politically as well. Uh, but first, I think we should learn about the evidence, and uh, then we have our first speaker uh, from TU Delft, and he's going to walk us through his presentation of how ESPAN has uh, contributed to our understanding of a greener Europe in this new uh, State of the European Territory report. So without further ado, um, Claudio, why don't you uh, come to the stage and uh, give your presentation? Uh, thank you, David. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Claudio Forgac. I'm um, from Delft University of Technology, and I was responsible with uh, putting together this chapter. Um, so this chapter compiles uh, territorial evidence on the current state and trends and gives policy recommendations for a greener, low-carbon Europe. The chapter is structured um, in four sections corresponding to the specific objectives of the European Regional Development Fund and Cohesion Fund funding set in 2018. For each of these four sections, I will present a selection of key messages. But before I do that, uh, let's have a look at the wider context. The transition towards a low carbon economy has become one of the main challenges of European regions and cities in the last decades. With sustainable growth as one of its three priorities, the Europe 2020 strategy promotes a more resource efficient, greener and more competitive economy. This is attainable by decoupling economic growth from the use of resources, decarbonizing the economy, increasing the use of renewable resources, modernizing the transport sector, and promoting energy efficiency. According to the Territorial Agenda 2020, geographic conditions and specificities represent the main factors influencing the regional potential for the production of renewable energy and for adaptation to climate change. Yet, harnessing that potential is mostly dependent on national policies as are energy efficiency measures in regions with scarce resources. Uh, therefore, the transition to greener, low-carbon Europe requires measures and actions on multiple levels, including tackling local challenges besides the ones targeted by European, regional and national policies. In this context, uh, policies and measures addressing the territorial challenges of energy transition, climate change mitigation and adaptation circular economy and green infrastructure are essential for a greener, uh, low, carbon, low carbon economy. Territorial vulnerability to climate change depends on exposure to natural disasters, land use and potential of green infrastructure networks and the level of socioeconomic development required for investment in mitigation and adaptation measures. Not least, a circular economy uh, requires um, uh, emphasizes specific development opportunities for different types of territories at different scales, as well as new business models aiming at recycling and reusing more waste. All the aforementioned drivers of a greener and low carbon econo economy should be approached from a systemic perspective, both in urbanized and rural territories, in order to reveal the complex interactions and interdependencies between energy systems, mobility systems, and food systems in the context of climate change. Green infrastructure plays an important role in providing ecosystem services and in pre preserving biodiversity on both regional and urban level. On regional level, ecological connectivity, one of the prerequisites of ecosystem functioning, is hindered by increasing landscape fragmentation due to transport infrastructure, construction activities, and settlement dynamics across Europe. According to the European Environment Agency, the Benelux countries are the most fragmented, whereas Eastern European and Mediterranean countries, Ireland and Scotland, show lower levels of fragmentation pressure of urban transport and infrastructure ex expansion. In this context, the potential green infrastructure network at the regional level shows low coverage in Northwestern Europe, Southeastern UK and Ireland. This is mainly influenced by population density, infrastructure development, climatic and topographic conditions and agricultural land distribution. A 
A high coverage of potential GI can be observed in Nordic countries, the Balkan countries along the Adriatic Sea, and in the Eastern Alpine region. At the urban scale, the coverage with green areas is generally decreasing. The European territory is dominated by cities in which green areas have remained stable, mostly in Central and Northwestern Europe and Alpine countries, or have decreased in Eastern and Southern countries. The reasons for this development are mainly urbanization and econo economic development after the accession to the EU or for touristic purposes in Southern Europe. This development can also be observed in the Netherlands and Finland, and only a few cities show an increase in green space coverage. Uh, therefore, to support cooperation on regional and local levels, GI-related policies should consider all three inherent elements of GI, connectivity, multifunctionality, and the links with spatial planning. Regions with low potential GI network coverage in Northwestern Europe require improved connectivity of existing GI, whereas regions with high potential GI network coverage should be supported through policies promoting sustainable land use and increased biodiversity. The multifunctionality and potential network coverage of GI at regional level should ideally serve the purpose of purposes of multiple policy frameworks, such as biodiversity, water management, and climate change. To that end, trade-offs between policy objectives are inevitable and should be negotiated when selecting GI over other land uses. Climate change has a differentiated impact on European biogeographical -ge regions, according to the European Environmental Agency. ESPON evidence show that uh, the regions that are the most exposed to the, to the overall impact of climate change are in the south of Europe, regions with specific Geographic specificities such as mountain areas in Norway or the Dutch coastline also have a high exposure, partly due to economic dependency on tourism and sea level rise, respectively. Northwestern and southern European coastal regions are most sensitive to extreme events. Exacerbated by sea level rise and projected river floods, uh, floods northwestern European coastal regions bordering the Atlantic Ocean and smaller hotspots such as the Po River Valley and Venice in Italy, as we saw recently, are most sensitive to extreme weather events. <coughs> Climate change will have the highest environmental impact in the north and south of Europe. Important factors for the potential environmental impact of climate change are high slopes, especially in mountainous regions, specific soil conditions that facilitate soil erosion, such as in river deltas or along coasts, and the large size of protected areas, for instance, in northern Scandinavia. The spatial distribution of flood risk across Europe has not changed significantly between 2002 and 2012. The river basins of the Rhine and the Danube, as well as the Po uh, and the river systems of England, have the highest risk of flooding in Europe. Areas with drought risks are concentrated along the Mediterranean, and an increase in risks has also been observed in the past 20 years in the Carpathian regions, including Hungary and Romania, and in Ireland. Overall, the regions in South and Southeast Europe are the most exposed exposed to natural hazards. Thus, vulnerable territories in South and Southeastern Europe that may need guidance in drafting climate change adaptation, mitigation, and resilience strategies should be supported through transfer of good practices from frontrunner regions and cities in Northern and Northwestern Europe. In addition, frontrunner regions could learn from local unplanned adaptations and bottom-up initiatives in less developed regions. Thus, transfer of good practices can be supported by a shared database of successful adaptation and mitigation strategies and by comparative studies meant to identify differences and similarities between territories. The ambition of European regions and cities to transition towards a low-carbon economy has resulted in several changes in energy consumption and supply and in related policies. Yet fossil fuels are still dominant in energy demand and global greenhouse gas agreements have not been met, despite the increasing deployment of renewable energy and increased energy efficiency across Europe. 
the share of energy from renewable sources varies from 50% with the highest values concentrated in Northern Europe to low values in South, South and East Europe, as well as the United Kingdom and Ireland, and less than 10% in the highly urbanized Benelux region in Northwestern Europe. The variance in regional patterns of renewable energy potential is mainly influenced by climatic and geographic differences uh, across Europe. This variance is visible, for instance, in the concentration of wi wind energy potential in northwestern Europe and the Baltic region, and in the high potential for solar power in southern Europe. However, investments are not necessarily made where the potentials are highest for the targeted renewable energy source. For instance, photovoltaic power generation was also developed in less privileged solar regions in Central Europe. Improvement in energy efficiency have decreased after 2010 due to loss of political will to counter climate change, combined with reduced investments in eco-upgrading industries. Yet energy efficiency measures remain, inherent, uh, remain important, especially for regions that are vulnerable in terms of social cohesion. Rural regions in southeastern Europe and most of Eastern Europe are the most vulnerable to energy poverty in case of rising energy prices. Many of these regions have the potential to develop uh, renewable energy, but lack either the administrative capacity, the vision, or the financial resources to implement these measures. In consequence, the future of renewable energy har harnessing should be based on geographic potential. The results of a tr territorial foresight in which Europe's energy supply and consumption are 100% renewable in 2030, as presented in an ESPON, report illustrate the need to use all territorial potentials. Such a quick transition would imply a focus on harnessing wind power in Northwestern Europe, solar power in Southern Europe, and hydropower in the Alps, Scandinavia, and some parts of Southeastern Europe. To support this transition, energy systems may need to become more decentralized and democratic with direct involvement of citizens through ownership of energy installations. The concept of circular economy introduces a new model for economic growth, transforming industrial production and consumption habits and offering new opportunities for both businesses and the society. Um, since a circular economy demands for trans more transformational approaches to supply and demand of materials, consumers and producers of primary and secondary materials which follow different territorial patterns are particularly relevant for the analysis. The total amount of material directly used in an economy, or a so-called domestic material consumption per capita, is influenced by local availability and use of natural resources and by population density. As in less, uh, density po de less densely populated regions, the value of DMC per capita tends to be higher than in densely populated regions. This effect is particularly evident in Northern Europe where it is coupled with economies with strong reliance on material intensive sectors such as wood processing and mining. Hence, changes in domestic material consumption show a strong correlation with economic cycles. The regions with the strongest declines between 2006 and 2014 uh, in Southern Europe are also those that were hit hardest by the global economic crisis in 2008 and therefore show declining DMC per capita values in the period 2006-2014 and declining or stagnating GDP per capita levels. Personal income is one of the main drivers of the total amount of waste generated. Regions with higher GDP per capita tend to produce more waste and this could explain why urban regions have in general greater per capita values of waste generation. In these areas, however, waste collection infrastructure may simply be better developed, allowing more waste to be collected and treated, including waste coming from rural regions, thus ex explaining the higher values of food waste and household waste per capita. The implementation and diffusion of circular business models uh, is favored by industrial and urban agglomerations in proximity of knowledge hubs. Hence, the over 9,000 regional pioneers across all member states that have adopted circular business models concentrate in high, highly populated regions. 
Due to the contribution of sustainable agriculture and forestry, circular economy material providers play a particularly predominant role in rural regions. Organic farming, sustainable forestry, and the provision of wood materials remain the largest employment sector in the circular economy material providers sector. Waste collection and recycling services also play an important role in rural areas, particularly in those that benefit from their proximity to industrial processes and urban centers. In most regions, employment in the circular economy is growing and productivity of circular economy material providers is increasing. The competitiveness of regional economies is linked to the possibility of implementing circular economy strategies, ranging from industrial symbiosis schemes to product remanufacturing. These are more likely to emerge in territories where a diverse industrial ecosystem is already in place or where the products are originally manufactured. Industrial regions in decline may also find opportunities in the emerging markets of secondary raw materials thanks to the availability of industrial plots. One more point. Um, all in all, the implementation uh, and diffusion of circular business models requires cooperation and sharing of knowledge between regional and local governments, material providers, industries, and scientific centers in order to achieve a sound mapping of av available resources. Yeah, these were the main messages of the chapter Greener Low Carbon Europe. Thank you. Well, that was very rapid. I gave you time. And then uh, 30 seconds later, you actually uh, stuck to it. So th thank you very much for, uh, for keeping time. Um, now, we move to the second part of the, the talk. So we've now had a good overview of exactly what's in the chapter and uh, what's, what's at issue and also some recommendations. And now we have some of the producers of the research that uh, supported that, uh, that chapter uh, here at the table and a few policymakers who uh, I suppose are the addressees of uh, all this research. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, to the floor our uh, panel discussants. So, uh, Gemma Garcia Blanco, first of all. She's from Tecnalia in Spain. And she was one of the researchers. And uh, Tobias Chilla from University of Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany. Please. And uh, Matilda Kompstam Polon um, from. Ministry of Development and Investments in Greece. And Martina Oblak Penic, am I saying that? Penic, yeah, from uh, Croatia, who's going to hold the next presidency and hopefully have some great things to say about ESPAN and how they're going to use ESPAN results in the green economy. So, um, yes. All of you have prepared a statement of about uh, five minutes or so to uh, to give your view of uh, yeah what what this is. Maybe we should mix it up a bit. That have a, a, a researcher, then a policymaker, and then a researcher and a policymaker, just to uh, do it like that. So um, yes, let's start off with uh, with Kemen, maybe, and uh, the floor is yours for uh, for five minutes. Please explain your your role. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting Greta or me to represent in the Greta team, which is uh, University of Barcelona, Norwegian in uh, Sweden, um, the James Hutton Institute in um, Edinburgh, um, Space for Environment uh, in Luxembourg, which made the, uh, the all the maps and, and the cartography. So I would like to start, well, thanks, Claudia, because you were just um, translated all the key messages from the Greta. So I'm not going to get into much more detail about the methodology we, we uh, develop and so on. We, we can come back later on that. But I would like to be the, um, well, in English it says the Jiminy Cricket <laughs> here, just to, to claim or reinforce uh, the role of the green infrastructure in the nexus of energy efficiency, soil, water, uh, food production. So. Um, it's, uh, green infrastructure is not an extra layer 
to be considered for nature conservation or biodiversity is more than that. It's a way of um, assessing um, um, the, the multiple functions that the green infrastructure could provide for, um, in, yeah, in terms of um, uh, the soil management, the water cycle maintenance, um, climate change adaptation. So it's, it's more than an extra layer that difficult territorial development. And this, this is something that we find out in our case studies. For some regions or for some municipalities, having a, a green infrastructure layer or map um, becomes like an impediment for development rather than an opportunity to think different about um, territorial challenges. So uh, we strengthen this in Greta, try to, to see how um, we could uh, not convince, but can we show some evidences about the green infrastructure benefits for thinking different about the spatial planning in particular. Um, and this is one of the main challenges that we find out, how to integrate this green infrastructure and ecosystem services approach into spatial planning, which sometimes is um, a question of planning culture, um, planning system culture in different regions and in different countries change that a lot. We find out in uh, cross-border regions that different spatial planning um, cultures or different spatial planning systems come up with a very different uh, ways of management of land and green infrastructure. With a, um, we see an opportunity for cooperation, but it is definitely a hot spot that should be um, um, yeah, um, taken into consideration, particular, for instance, for water management is something very, very, uh, very crucial. Just to, um, for most of you, probably you are aware of what Greta produced, but basically, uh, we produced um, a novel, a novel methodology to uh, map uh, green um, infrastructure distribution, distribution of green areas, uh, basically um, Natura 2000 and, and other projected sites, but also other, si uh, other uh, kind of um, semi-natural areas. And with this, um, we produce what we call the, the physical map. On top of that, we analyze the functionality behind this, this, um, this um, 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 physical mapping. And the functionality is what kind of ecosystem services this network is providing. And the third analysis is what are the policy objectives that these ecosystem services are contributing to. So with, with this approach, is, is we are overcoming this idea of green infrastructure being only um, about conservation or enhancement of bio biodiversity is a, a little bit more. So I, I can stop here. I've got some um, well, reflections on on how the research should be placed on for further analysis, but we can come up later on. So I'm, I'm done with this preliminary introduction. speech that I have prepared. And well, actually, it's more that uh, in, uh, in the case of the research, your research, Greta, and also the state of uh, European territory, uh, we miss blue infrastructure. We, coming from an island uh, country, of course, and uh, this is something that I had later on uh, to deal with, but I, I wanted to say that uh, insularity and the island regions uh, should be dealt in a particular way, uh, especially when uh, Claudio uh, spoke about uh, heterogeneity, multifunctionality, and uh, connectivity regarding green infrastructure. Well, out of these three, the two cannot apply into island regions. So in this case, we have a fragmented area, and this has to be dealt differently especially when we are talking about putting green and greener Europe and this whole chapter and this whole policy objective into a territorial dimension, into a special dimension. Very interesting reflection from, uh, from policy side on this uh, in the specific uh, region, uh, specificity in, uh, in Europe. Um, I want to 
uh, remind the, the people at home and the people here uh, that we're also using Slido. So it's meant to be interactive in the sense that you can also ask the panel questions, you can ask uh, uh, also our main presenter questions to, to elaborate on uh, part of the, uh, of the chapter as well. So uh, please take your advantage of doing that as well, uh, and you can already prepare that. We will have a Q&A after the panel discussion, but you can already think about uh, your questions beforehand. Uh, let's go to our second uh, presenter of the uh, policy, or the uh, research side, <laughs> Tobias. Yeah, thank you, David. C can I go on the driver's seat and uh, show some slides? Um, then we have to do the technician slides with you. Okay, yeah. So thank you, and thank you, Claudio, for that was for the input. And I agree to everything, but I would like to complement one or two uh, arguments with regard to the greener Europe. Um, I would like to comment on this uh, against the background of the Alps 2050 project that we concluded some months uh, ago, <coughs> and this is. Uh, this region that you see here in the back, and uh, you have the, the high mountain ranges in the center of the perimeter, and you have the, 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 the valleys and the more urban, urbanized areas uh, surrounding it. So when we talk about uh, greener Europe, then this is uh, um, uh, without a doubt a region that shows in some parts a very high vulnerability with regard to climate change, with regard to landslides, but also with regard to uh, touristic uh, uh, sectors like uh, mountaineering, uh, skiing, and so on. So this is really illustrating what, what Claudio um, has said here. At the same time, it uh, is the potential to be one of the forerunner uh, regions. So when we talk about the two degrees Celsius, uh, Celsius deg uh, uh, um, objective, uh, this is something that is uh, already surpassed in this region. So we can already uh, have a look uh, uh, into, the into the future here. Then it's a region that has a very rich um, and dense uh, governance and cooperation experience. Uh, we have here uh, seven nation states uh, involved, uh, uh, amongst them uh, Switzerland as non-EU country, uh, Liechtenstein as a small state, Slovenia as a as an Eastern European uh, country, and so on. So it's really it's a very complex and diverse uh, issue here. And at the same time, it's a, it's a successful, it's a rich region. I mean, uh, uh, most parts uh, of the area that you see here, they are uh, really above the European average, and many of them are above the average of their uh, national uh, uh, um, uh, values. For example, for the south uh, uh, of Germany, this is really true for the north of, of Italy. So what to do with that uh, when we talk about the, the greener Europe? And I think, one argument that I would like to add is to um, address the, the risk of, of, of being too sectoral. When we talk about uh, environmental issues, uh, it's of course, it's about water management, it's about nature conservation, uh, uh, it's about all these issues. But in the end, who, who coordinates um, transformation processes towards a greener uh, economy? or greener development. And I would say that the, the natural candidate for doing so is the spatial development uh, um, uh, side. And uh, that I missed a bit in, in, in the chapter that you provided uh, for obvious reasons, because there's no spatial development uh, mandate on the European level. But I think uh, we have to think about uh, uh, these issues. I want to illustrate this uh, by means of this map. What you see here is one of our ecosystem uh, services maps um, and uh, done at, at Eurac in Bolzano. And here we see on the left-hand side the drinking water demand, which is concentrated in the metropolises. And we see on the uh, right-hand side the drinking water supply, which is uh, concentrated in the mountain ranges. And it's obvious that you have to organize uh, this, this functional region, if you want. So you have to ensure that uh, you have enough drinking water in the big cities and uh, you have to organize it in a fair way so that you have still agricultural activities in the high mountain range and so on. And that kind of, of challenge you have in all parts around uh, the uh, uh, the Alps. You have it between the Po Valley and the mountain ranges. You have it uh, between Munich and the mountain regions and so on. So this is really showing the complexity here. 
And if we uh, put away now the drinking water issue, but turn to, uh, let's say, uh, hydropower, uh, water energy, and say, well, what are the geographical potentials here? Well, it's in the, in the center of the mountains. We can uh, put another uh, 200 uh, uh, hydropower plants there. Uh, and that would be, uh, from the sectoral point of view, perfect. So because you have the morphology there, you have the rain there, there so let's go for it. But I would say from the spatial development side, it's not easy as that because um, first of all, you have um, political and societal concerns. There will be really uh, NGOs and, and, and movements who say, no, our valley is not supposed to be a hydropower uh, place. And secondly, you have uh, other sectoral concerns like uh, nature conservation, a settlement system, tourism, and so on, who are against hydropower in a, in a large extent. So what I mean is, this is one, maybe a bit drastic, but, but one of the examples that show if we, if we understand greening uh, Europe too much in the sectoral way, then it's, uh, it, it comes along with, uh, with some dangers. The second, uh, well, this is just an illustration from, from the, the, the Alps uh, 2050 process, uh, just shows some of our comics that we produced uh, that come from a, from, a, from a communication process, from a debate with stakeholders. What could the Alpine future look like depending on what priorities you have there? I will not go into the detail, but that shows, uh, I think, quite in a, in, a, in a didactic way that it does make a difference what your objective with regard to spatial development is. It makes a difference also with regard to the environment, with regard to the role of green infrastructure and so on. And this leads me to, to the question of scale or level. Uh, in, in your report and in your presentation, you illustrated very well the, the, the role of the local, the regional, the, the national, the European level. What we see here and, and in, the, in the map before, that was the transnational, the macro-regional level. And from my point of view, this is a very uh, relevant uh, level, also with regard to uh, environmental concerns. I mean, here we have a large uh, mountain, scale, uh, uh, mountain range, like we have others in Europe, and uh, I think that it does make very much sense to address environmental issues on this um, scale. And if we have a look to the macro-regional policy in general, then it uh, started with uh, um, the objective to address common geographical challenges or concerns. And I think this is exactly what we are talking about here, uh, common geographical concerns that are, for example, water management, climate change, and so on. So this is uh, the, the second and last uh, proposal that I would uh, make uh, for the uh, for the for the chapter, that uh, considering that the transnational level has some potential to, in particular, if we take the spatial development perspective. So I think that was more or less five minutes. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Um, I'm also struck by this. This is a typical ESPON kind of uh, research, I think, in, in the way that you try to imagine a European space without borders and, and to look at things from, from the side of the, uh, the problem and manifestation of the problem and possible solutions. And then when you get into that, you get into all these different borders, the borders between sectors and then the borders between jurisdictions. And then you get into the messy uh, world of how do you uh, create the political um, uh, will and uh, political organization to actually address these problems. So uh, thank you very much for that, for a very, uh, let's say, uh, ESPON, uh, point of view. Um, let's go to uh, uh, Matil, you want to uh, give your intervention as a, um, as a policymaker, what would you uh, see from this? Yeah. Uh, I liked it mostly the other way when I had to, <laughs> to just make a comment on what uh, Hema said and I was about to make a comment to what uh, Tobias said, but okay, I will start <laughs> Uh, the uh, orthodox way, let's say. Okay, so, um, well, as uh, a policy maker, I work at the Ministry of um, Development and Investments in Greece, uh, and uh, uh, which means that uh, Greener Europe is actually in the hands of the Ministry of Environment and Energy. So I have to make it clear that I don't want to step in their shoes and uh, it's their uh, cuisine, but uh, as uh, a ministry responsible for the SC funds and the preparation of uh, the programming periods, uh, we do have a role as uh, coordinators. So the first step is that uh, 
they do what they think uh, crucial and important as uh, regards their ministry, as regards Greener Europe. They should uh, go through the report. They send us their proposals for uh, the next programming period, what, they, what we should include in which uh, sectoral or regional programs and from that point on we uh, check eligibility, we check regulations, we go through uh, all the strategic documentation and we incorporate their suggestions, their proposals into the strategic uh, documents for the next programming period. So this is how uh, things work uh, for planning and how we intend to use uh, not only this report, uh, but all uh, information from the relevant reports. Uh, they are in the hands of the relevant ministries. They make their comments. They send back to us. They take them into consideration when preparing their uh, political, let's say, documents and policy documents. Uh, and we uh, do the coordination part of the job. Regarding the state of uh, European territory, I already mentioned uh, before uh, the issue of insularity and uh, blue infrastructures, especially now that back at home there is a political discussion, I have to stress that, nothing is decided, but there is a political discussion that there may, may be a sectoral program dedicated to insularity issues and to maritime uh, um, and marine and maritime affairs. So uh, from that point, uh, it is quite important that we have uh, the background document, we have some basis to start our discussion, to start building the relevant program if such a decision is taken. Apart from that, I have uh, three examples that I would like to mention regarding uh, that fit in the, uh, the report and that could be uh, food for the next programming period. Uh, the first one uh, refers to the ener renewable energy and uh, to energy transition. We have uh, uh, the region of Western Macedonia and the megalopolis uh, um, city in the Peloponnese, both highly dependent on lignite and producing electricity from uh, coal and lignite. So uh, during the next programming period, uh, thanks to the Just Transition Fund, but also to all this uh, Greener Europe, let's say, initiative, uh, there will be um, a very strong uh, move towards uh, renewable energies. They will uh, quit, uh, uh, close down some factories uh, on production of electricity with the traditional ways. So the renewable energy, energy transition, and all the points that are made within the report will be taken into consideration for the preparation of the regional programs, but also the sectoral program depending on uh, energy and environment. This is the one example. Another example is uh, on circular economy with the city of Iraklio from Crete, which implements a, a food waste uh, uh, project under the Urban Initiative Actions Program and which treats uh, hotel and restaurant waste in order to be further um, better used and not to have this much waste, especially during the tourism period. Uh, this is a, a, a good practice example, uh, since uh, Claudio in the report mentions also that there, is, there should be some kind of transfer of good practices from one part of Europe to another, but also I would say from one program to another. So this is a, a project implemented under UIA, but region of Crete will take the good results, the, the, the good example, the best practice, and will, able, will be able to incorporate it in their regional program now that they are preparing the next programming period. And my last example would be on the macro regions and especially the EUCR macro region, the, ma uh, the macro region of the Adriatic and Ionian region. Uh, as Tobias said, the, we are moving to new functional areas. We are, where we are approaching Europe from a different uh, territorial perspective. Macro regions are there and are evolving, uh, elaborating. Uh, our macro region, which is a relevant uh, new one, under the priority of environmental uh, protection and biodiversity, has uh, built 
the blue and uh, uh, green corridors along the coastline of uh, the Adriatic, Ionian and Adriatic uh, um, uh, Sea, uh, starting from uh, Peloponnese in Greece, going through Albania, Croatia, Slovenia, and all the way around the Adriatic to uh, Italy. So uh, these blue and green corridors uh, are something that need to be elaborated, taking the good uh, practices, taking the suggestions and the proposals in the um, report that was presented. And uh, according to these proposals, we will uh, elaborate, we will change, we will evolve the action plan of the strategy, which is to be revised in view of the next programming period. And I think that there are uh, nice, good inputs from the report that will help us to do the revision of the action plan. Well, that sounds very positive. Um, I was just wondering about how it first gets read by a different ministry from the environmental ministry, and then it goes to you, uh, who has to do the investments. Do they read the report, do you think, in a different way than you would read it? Because many times the uh, environmental side reads things in terms of regulations, and the structural funds is all about uh, many times more bottom-up projects. Uh, do you think that there's uh, a, a translation uh, issue hit here, or do you work together about this? Do they know enough about how structural funds work that they could uh, give you good recommendations? How, how is that working uh, in practice? I think this is a problem that uh, it's not that we back at home face, but uh, it has to be uh, a common uh, practice, negative practice in many countries, because each ministry has its own language, uh, its own understanding of things. And that's why we have this coordination role in order to give the European perspective, the country perspective, but uh, apart from that, uh, taking also the into consideration the ESPON evidence, we have also to have a more uh, special, a more territorial approach. Uh, in the case of uh, the energy and environmental issues, I think this, uh, in particular back at home, this uh, special uh, approach uh, is missing. And there is needs some fine tuning because what, between what we do and what they do in order to have a common understanding and to, to, to work together and to proceed into the new programming period together. And uh, to add into this point, uh, the new regulations and the new programming period has also introduced the enabling conditions, which are some, uh, let's say, prerequisites, some ex-ante conditions that have to be met before proceeding, before uh, doing, uh, uh, be before uh, obtaining the goals of the country, according to the new uh, programming period. And uh, this is also something that we have, uh, let's say, to, to make them understand and to comply with. Okay, let's uh, shift a little bit, but not so much geographically, I suppose, because we're still in the same <coughs> region, also a very long coast uh, and uh, beautiful nature. Let's uh, hear your perspective on uh, this chapter of the uh, of the ESPON uh, report. Okay. Um, uh, um, um, yes, my name is Martina. I'm coming from Croatian Ministry of uh, Construction and uh, Physical Planning. Uh, I work uh, in a department from programs and projects uh, of the EU uh, in Office for Strategic Planning and Project Development. Uh, I've been working uh, with the ESPON program for a year as a monitor committee member. Um, I, I, I like to say that uh, I'm, I'm with you about this chapter for blue uh, infrastructure. Um, as you may know, we uh, Croatia is uh, holding a presidency next year, so tomorrow we will uh, present the objectives of our presidency. Uh, all we know that uh, next year will be very ch challenging for Croatia. Uh, mm, uh, for this topic, I would uh, only say, uh, related to this panel session, that uh, one of uh, our Croatian presidency program 
priorities, uh, which is uh, also focus of our ministry, uh, is balance and sustainable development of the union and its member states. In terms of sustainable economic growth and transition to low carbon and circular economy. Um, uh, over the next decade, uh, EU, uh, EU policies on greenhouse gases, energy efficiency, and transition to circular economy will become even deeper, and uh, that will have a strong uh, impact on types of policies that Croatia will have to ad adopt. Uh, I would like to um, just uh, say mm, what we've been doing on these subjects. Um, during this uh, financial period, um, through the Euro European Regional Development Fund, uh, we promoted energy efficiency uh, and renewable energy by reducing energy consumption in public and residential buildings. And 90% of the allocations have been reserved so far. Um, regarding uh, renewables in Croatia, um, excluding hydropower, uh, renewables in Croatia present uh, less than 2% of total capacity, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the investments uh, needs to be drastically intensified uh, to reach the new EU targets, and um, it's necessary to put a place a new regulatory framework. Um, as we see in the report, energy efficiency measures are most needed along the Adriatic coasts and in the mountain areas where heating and cooling needs are high. Uh, and these regions have the potential to develop renewable energy system, systems, solar and wind, uh, but they have lack of administrative and financial resources. Um, currently, Croatia is working on national development strategy for 2030, which is harmonized with uh, SDGs uh, and should be adopted uh, by government during our presidency in March. Uh, this uh, national strategy will present national development and implementation framework for new partnership uh, agreements, uh, for operational programs and awarding grants from SC funds during the next uh, period. Um, then I'd like to say, um, due to the proposal of common provision regulation and the policy objective of green low carbon Europe, and our national development strategy's objective transition to smart, circular, and low carbon society, uh, Croatia will continue with uh, improving its renewables and energy efficiency by decarbonizing the national building stock through deep energy renovation and refine uh, measures uh, to better support energy poverty uh, in accordance with long-term renovation strategy. Uh, also in this objective, green and blue investments in circular economy, climate adaptation and risk prevention, our sector's priority will be uh, development of green infrastructure and uh, reuse of building and spaces in terms of transition to circular economy, but focusing on urban areas. Uh, um, considering that at the moment uh, dedicated national programs and strategies uh, on the implementation of greener infrastructure are missing and there's no special uh, regulatory uh, or economic policy instruments for promoting transition to a circular economy. Uh, we're developing now uh, two programs. Uh, one is the Urban Green Infrastructure Development Program and uh, the other is uh, circular management of building and spaces development program. Uh, these programs uh, we're developing with the uh, academic society from University of Zagreb, uh, Faculty of Architecture, and we're expecting them to be adopted by our, our government uh, during our presidency. Uh, these two programs will be aligned with uh, two ESPON policy briefs on these two topics in, of course, wider territorial aspect, and they both with the programs will help us uh, within discussion among stakeholders during our presidency. Um, so, this is much it of, <laughs> I mean, I can tell you a little bit more about these green programs that we are doing, but I don't know if we have time, <laughs> so. I, I have a quick question. When you um, 
see these S-Bun maps, like uh, the ones about uh, renewables and wind energy or solar energy, um, and you look at uh, how much you have already accomplished in, in Croatia, which 2% uh, yeah, isn't so high, do you think these maps can help get the message across in your country by showing the European perspective? Uh, do you think that uh, you can be supported by Espan to go to your politicians and say that uh, that this is important because uh, you see that uh, maybe we're having having a, a a poor ratio in terms of uh, the amount of renewables we could have in that map and and what we've already installed. Uh, yes, but um, um, on this topic, uh, I cannot. Uh, this is uh, also uh, from other ministry um, your jurisdiction, but um, we we mainly focused on energy and innovation. So and uh, now we are going to do uh, about developing this green infrastructure and uh, circular management uh, of built space in urban areas. So. Uh, the map, um, uh, of course, we 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 expect uh, some evidence. I mean, uh, to use some evidence from Espon, which will be in this policy policy briefs, uh, like to s to support planning and uh, indicators, um, best practices and policy exams, um, challenging and risks in uh, green infrastructure. Um, integration of green infrastructure into spatial planning and design urban areas. So, so yes. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've uh, arrived on time with our panel discussion, uh, more or less. So uh, it's time to take questions from the audience. Uh, we've had a lot of information. We've had uh, the, the uh, half hour, uh, 15 minutes of the... Uh, uh, of the chapter itself, plus uh, some reflections from uh, some of the people who did the actual research behind that uh, chapter and uh, some reflection from policymakers about uh, ways forward. Um, anyone from the, uh, the audience would uh, care to ask a question? Or perhaps one of you have already asked a question via Slido. Uh, there are already one, two, three, four, five questions you uh, prefer to do that digitally. No? Okay, let's go to the, the top uh, Slido question, and that's here, uh, it's to the uh, MC members, uh, back that's uh, here, table. The, uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with ESPON jargon, M MC is uh, uh, the monitoring committee, and these are the people who work uh, in Espan as, as a, uh, on the political side of it. Um, and they asked what specific evidence from the Greta project, and that was the green infrastructure project, uh, was would be most useful for policy making in your country in relation to greener Europe. I think you already addressed this a little bit, but... Uh, uh, you mean the question to the MC members? Okay, I feel I'm sitting for exams. Somebody here wants to see how good we do our work at the monitoring committee. <laughs> okay, so, uh, of course, you don't expect me to know the Greta project by heart, huh? <laughs> no way. But what uh, Hema said before, and I found it quite useful, and I think it's really important, is that uh, w when we talk about green infrastructure, and allow me to add blue infrastructure all the time, uh, well, there are uh, impediments, as she mentioned, and this is a challenge how to incorporate a green and blue infrastructure into special planning. And I think this is a point that the Greta project approaches in a very understandable and uh, in a very understandable way. And this is something that we have to take back to our special planners, to the correspondent ministry, and make them understand that, okay, the one does not exclude the other. Having green and blue uh, infrastructure does not mean that we can't have uh, special planning or we are going to ruin, uh, to, to have benefits on the one hand, but 
uh, ruin the environment or uh, cause other kind of problems or social problems or whatever, on the other hand. So this is quite important uh, and I think this covers overall uh, what uh, Greta uh, project contributes to, to this particular uh, thematic. I would say um, not uh, for especially one project, but um, only with uh, these um, main observations. Um, I mean, um, Croatia is 47% covered with uh, Natura 2000, and um, we have a lot of fermentations in the cities. So um, our main focus will be on that topic. And Do you think the European perspective adds anything to be able to, to see that these things extend over borders and to use benchmarks at the EU level? Because uh, you're working, of course, with probably national concepts and national plans and uh, maybe the information you get from ESPAN might look slightly different. Um, do you think that this uh, adds a new dimension or do you think that uh, the people in Croatia might be critical of, of ESPAN? Uh, what is your uh, take on this? No, 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 no comment. <laughs> okay, um, then we can maybe move ahead. Anyone? care to, to contribute about uh, green infrastructure uh, ideas? Yeah, so this one. Um, um, since I'm, I'm working for the Swiss, uh, a Swiss MC member for the uh, Federal Office for Spatial Planning, so I'm oh. in between, like uh, in between policy making and research. So my, my question, um, especially to the researchers, what is your experience when it comes to bringing your research or knowledge to policy makers? How does that happen and where do you feel that uh, maybe there is some improvement needed? I'm going to answer first to, to this question about the blue and green. Just to clarify that in Greta, we incorporated the, the inland green, I mean, all the rivers and uh, wetlands and so on, and not the coastal areas. So I'm, I'm completely, I fully agree with you, but it was not within the service that we, we developed for Espen. So it's something for the next, um, the next call. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with regards to what you say, what, how is the uptake of the, um, our research by the policymakers? I think that the, the one of the key uh, messages that we, we grasp for the case studies is the, the need for evidences. It's like monitoring what are the evidence that the green infrastructure is, is, devel is um, um, contributing to these benefits for flood risk reduction, for water quality, for soil. So they, they need uh, facts and figures. So it is, it's about evidences and compare uh, scenarios with green versus gray to invest and to be more, um, yeah, it's about the risk that, that you mentioned before, David, is policies, uh, at least at the municipality level, don't want to take the risk to invest in something that they, they are not completely sure that is going to work. So un uh, unless it's a, a very strong social demand for green, they will opt for, for grey, which is more sure. And this takes me to an, a next step of a debate or discussion, which is how to incorporate the private sector in investment on, on green infrastructure. It's not on, on only about public administrations, but it's also the private attract uh, private investors and how they can uh, get a get kind of a profit out of it. And this is something that was only very, very little mentioned in Greta and is uh, probably something for, for, future, for future research. Yeah, one might understand your question in a more fundamental way. So this interface between uh, uh, research and policy is one of the most fundamental questions for the whole ESPON uh, program for more than 15 years now. Um, 
And I would say that there are some trivial preconditions like uh, you have to have open-minded researchers as policymakers, you have to have a focused research question and so on. But my experience is even if all these preconditions are given, many of the reports are forgotten very quickly and uh, because the, the, the interface is not organized. So I think you really have you, you need procedures where you meet regularly. And I mean, the, the targeted analysis of S1 is uh, excellent. I really uh, love this format, uh, but after one or two years, it's, it's, uh, the game is over and then, well, what to do next? And then there's uh, other issues on the agenda. And I think um, organizing these uh, procedures, um, this is something that is really the, the challenge on, on, on all levels, not only on the European level. So, or, or to respond it to, to in, a, in a more constructive way, if you ensure uh, a, a longer lasting process uh, with these open minded researchers and policy makers, then it will be fruitful anyway. Um, something I've noticed as a researcher myself that works for policy is that many times researchers are always in search of doing something new and they don't want to say anything that's been said before or has been researched before. but. Many times, you have to repeat your message again and again. And uh, so maybe you don't have to do the research again, but the, the core message, let's say, of ESPON, that territory matters and that you can uh, look at a certain problem, but it takes a different form in different types of territories, that's valuable. And you can just continue to repeat that over and over and over again. And, and perhaps the research is old or the research isn't very innovative, and you maybe already know the result of the research when you begin, but it's still very valuable in terms of uh, creating this policy transfer because, uh, well, policymakers always want to, to have the latest research and the latest numbers, but the, the, the results and the message can be a very old and fundamental one, uh, like territory matters, or in, in this case, maybe that uh, ecosystems and nature has benefits as well, then those benefits can actually be monetarized and uh, it, it's not just a question of, of uh, uh, costs for, for public, uh, the public sector. So uh, I guess um, maybe this is something uh, directed at the, the researchers, that uh, maybe it isn't such a bad thing to continue to, uh, to repeat ourselves uh, when we know that uh, this, is, this hasn't been taken up enough and uh, just say, yeah, continue, territory matters. <laughs> And uh, these, these types of um, uh, results that we've had in the past also can uh, apply to the future. Yeah. Looks like you want to say something? Here's a, another question. Hello, uh, I'm Sandra Momchilovic uh, from uh, Ministry of Construction and Physical Planning of Croatia. I work together with Martina but she works uh, more with uh, energy efficiency topics and uh, I was uh, a head of a service for a state level physical plans. So I would like to go back to your question <laughs> about uh, the plans and can we use uh, the data from a green uh, infrastructure structure project uh, for um, our uh, plans? So the answer is yes. Uh, right now, we are developing the state level physical plan. It is like a master plan. And after that, we will develop a new uh, generation of regional plans. So uh, the Croatia is fragmented. It has uh, 21 uh, regional plans and uh, I think more than 500 uh, local plans. Uh, so uh, this uh, the data that you put in your maps are very, very uh, useful for us and we are using them right now. Uh, and uh, also uh, with these uh, policy briefs uh, that uh, ESPON GTC is preparing for our presidency, uh, uh, we are, they are complementary with the programs of uh, green infrastructure in urban areas. And uh, the, these programs, uh, these, the, we have two topics for our presidency. One is green infrastructure in urban areas, and the uh, second one is reuse of space and buildings in, uh, in um, urban areas in terms of transition to circular economy. And they will be adopted by the government of Republic of Croatia. And that means that our politicians have to know 
they will know about uh, the importance of these topics. Although they are not uh, uh, in our uh, program, presidency program, but they are like specific topics of our presidency. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. That was an interesting intervention. Also brought up one of my favorite uh, topics, and that's spatial planning because, uh, of course, the European Union has no competency for spatial planning, yet uh, many of the challenges uh, that are being posed by Europe and many of the things addressed by ESPAN uh, can be addressed by spatial planning, and spatial planning in many times has statutory power to actually implement some of these things, so it's, it's very good to have a dialogue, open dialogue, when we talk about green infra infrastructure. In the end, most of this green infrastructure uh, comes into a spatial plan, and it's the spatial planners who actually have to, to implement this. So I think this is kind of an interesting topic maybe to raise with our panel here. To what extent um, do you, let's say for on the research, research side, think that uh, ESPAN should pay more attention to the implementation side of, uh, let's say, these territorial aspects within the planning system, and maybe from the uh, policy side, to what extent do you engage, let's say, the land use planning uh, in the implementation of some of these uh, more territorial aspects, like uh, greening the economy and that sort of thing? really difficult one, so I'm gonna just say some uh, ideas and see what happens, <laughs> because I think it's, it's um, um, from, from one hand, what ESPIN could do is try to use uh, different typologies of planning systems uh, to see what were the, the, um, the success uh, implementation of green infrastructures, and also what, what failed, the failures. In, in Greta, we only analyze best practices, but I think we should do it the other way around. We should analyze probably the failures to see really w which were the constraints, because some, sometimes you learn more from the failures. And so it's, it's, it's um, probably one of the, the issues that we could uh, um, assess. Yeah, and in different planning systems, because we find out the um, um, uh, Mediterranean countries work completely different due to probably land use um, policies than, than northern countries and the Eastern European works completely different. It's, it's, cult it's a cultural planning. It's a, so probably we need to analyze these different typologies and, and, and learn from the failures. This, this could be one of uh, um, ideas to, and also just to, to an, a second idea, uh, the scale matters. It's not this, uh, the way we analyze uh, green infrastructure on national, and uh, regional, and local level change completely. The benefits are different. Uh, the roles for managing and maintenance and, um, um, yeah, and, and make decisions are different. So probably a scale and types of, uh, of uh, systems, planning systems. <coughs> I'm, I'm on your side, David but I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about using spatial planning too much because that word is really scaring too many of the people and it's uh, often understood in a, in a, a misleading way. Um, and I think that the, the spatial perspective is not only for implementation. I mean, this is really the, the, the risk to understand uh, uh, spatial planning as uh, 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 implementing some, some sectoral issues there. For, for, for me, the, the, the spatial perspective is really more about anticipating the different uh, concerns about the spatial uh, dimension there. And, and that brings me back to, to, to the map on the uh, potential hydropower issue in, in, in the Alps. So for me, it's not, not that important that we discuss on the European uh, level how to implement or not, uh, and where and, and how a hydropower, but to, to show where in, on, on the maps are different concerns and potentials, how that overlays and, how we, uh, and, and where we can expect um, uh, different uh, fears or, 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 or demands. So f for me, it's more the coordinative, uh, the, the multi-sectoral uh, view uh, that's interesting on, 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 on this scale, as, as you said, on the transnational, on the cross-border, on the European scale. I mean, on the national scale, it's a bit different, I would say. Then it's m much more easy to go to the implementation um, side. Uh, 
Ja, ben je weer dit. Ja. In your opinion, should spatial planners at the national level uh, pay more attention to S-Fund? Do you think that's a, a blind spot? Oh, I, I don't know all of them, but I know, know some of them who, who read the S-Fund reports, others don't. Um, the, the question is more, um, what can we do about those who don't know S-Fund? Uh, how can we uh, uh, um, Im improve dissemination activities? How can we involve them in European uh, procedures? And th this is a good question for the contact points and, and for the for the outreach uh, department. And uh, Ilona has, has commented on, on, on this uh, this morning already. I mean, we, we still have a language that's too difficult. Uh, we, uh, we have this interface problems about expectations and yeah I mean after 20 years of, of Espan and European spatial development one could have expected to be already further but well we, we we are taking step by step and it's more complex than we anticipated 20 years ago I would say I don't know in the end <laughs> thanks well I think uh, Tobias put it very uh, to the point, and uh, I don't have much to say because actually, uh, well, he's concerned that when we use special planning too much and for every bits and pieces and for every implementation uh, uh, component. But uh, on the contrary, I think back at home, we are uh, lagging a bit behind on special planning. This is one thing. So I think, first of all, we have to create and uh, cultivate the mentality of special planning and what has to give to us. And uh, also, uh, back at home, uh, special planning is fragmented. So uh, some cases we have good examples, then these examples override or overrule or overturn other examples. Uh, and uh, this is an issue that has to be solved, of course, at national level. Apart from that, I also agree that um, the ESPON language and the ESPON results can be uh, sometimes difficult, and uh, especially when they are to be used by uh, special planners or by politicians or by people elected that have to work together with the special planners, then uh, the, you have two different worlds that cannot get easily combined and that uh, maybe end up into controversial uh, statements, into controversial approach of things. So uh, I think uh, in some cases uh, we should not focus on special planning or at least we should not say that, well, this is a special planning exercise and try to make it uh, easily understandable from those who have uh, uh, their task to implement. Those politicians, elected people, but also those uh, policy makers that uh, move forward to implementation. Uh, your, your colleague uh, yes. brought, brought this up for, for us. Um, maybe we can go to the most popular Slido question. Um, and that's uh, how can digital transition help to deliver greener Europe and how can it bring sustainability closer to citizens? And uh, this sounds very nice. And I can imagine all these citizens coming up with very innovative, nice ideas. And, and we were also told, I think, uh, earlier that uh, this should be made more democratic and uh, this uh, energy production, for example, more and more decentralized and democratic. That sounds very nice. On the other hand, there are many vested interests uh, that are very centralized and, and powerful. And uh, they would also argue that it's very efficient to do this in, in a centralized, organized way. Um, can this digital transition really offer something new? Can it, let's say, bring power back to, let's say, ordinary citizens and, and be a countervailing power for this? Anyone uh, want to, to kick off uh, this off with opinion? Tobias, you seem to... Uh, yeah, uh, I don't want to monopolize the discussion, but yeah, that, that uh, it's it's really an interesting question. I think. Uh, I mean, uh, it's trivial to say that uh, digitalization uh, has a great potential as a cross-cutting tool for greening uh, the world. Uh, it, it, it starts with a better information flow on, on transportation issues and it goes to, to medical issues in sparsely populated areas where you can uh, 
have uh, consultation hours uh, on the computer, and it goes to um, uh, visitors' guidance in, in the Alps uh, uh, saying, well, in February, don't use this way because there's some environmental issue there, but in March, it's okay again, and you see it on your map. So it's, it's endless to say where you have environmental or green issues that you can uh, improve and implement via digital um, tools. And that brings me a bit back to the to the discussion of, of, of this morning, uh, where we talked about smart cities. And um, well, smart cities is fine, but but I'm more like the smart part than the cities part, because I think we really have to talk about the smart regions. And uh, uh, if you want on 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 uh, smart cohesion or digital uh, cohesion, because uh, the the Alpine uh, case is a very interesting one. So if you want to to use these potentials of of digital transition, also in the rural parts, uh, then it's completely different than 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 in the uh, urbanized or metropolitan uh, places like New York, uh, Paris, and Amsterdam. What what we heard this morning, and there we have to really take care that we uh, take this into account. So my answer to this question would be um, uh, we we can use the potentials only if we have a territorial approach. So that sounds like a bit blah blah, but what's the difference? This morning we heard that um, uh, we will soon have 80% of the people uh, in, in um, uh, in cities, uh, that's true, and in cities it's easy to, to have this blue color of uh, accessibility to the internet, so that's uh, organizable, I would say. But you can have a, a country where you have 80% uh, people living in the city where the internet and, and, and digital issues are perfect, and still you can have 80% of the territory where, where you do not have any uh, internet or digital tools, because, and this is the, the digital, uh, digital divide that can be very hard. And if you talk about the Alpine uh, region uh, that, that I showed in the map, that digital uh, divide can really make a difference uh, if it's contributing to greening uh, uh, the, the uh, territory or if it contributes to metropolization and to polarization um, in the end. Um, it's, it's linked with, with one of the uh, your ideas about the, the populated areas. Uh, I think this is, this is um, relevant for a, s a small size cities probably rather than the metropolitan areas where it's already working so the smart cities approach as, as far as i understand is more for big uh, cities and it's not that, that common in, in the small areas and on, on, on this mo this monday last monday i was in a, in a santiago de compostela which is galicia uh, having a, a workshop on um, forest fire uh, it's a big issue in, uh, in this part of uh, Spain and also the cross-border with Portugal. It's massive, it's, a, it's really a, 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 a challenge and it's, it's getting worse with climate change. And the, the area is highly depopulated, so um, it, this increases the risk of um, the, the, well, the, 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 yeah, the biomass being there, not, not maintained, not clean. And one of the ideas for the municipalities that are in this area is digitalizing. So people having access for, for early warning systems, to mobilize the brigades, uh, to coordinate with the, with the, so it's not about greening only, it's also about hazard and, and digitalization of these depopulated areas are, are really relevant to that. Perhaps uh, it could uh, have some impact on agriculture as well, because uh, agriculture is also a, a very big uh, environmental polluter, and maybe through some smart technologies, digitization, uh, information about those pollutants, uh, it could also Im improve that as well. So uh, I guess there's uh, work to do in the rural areas as, uh, as well as uh, urban areas. And, and, and even for at attractivity of those young um, agriculture, um, agriculture that could that could come back to the rural areas. Any thoughts from our uh, policymaker side about uh, about this digitization? Whether uh, you see opportunities and how these uh, could be implemented and what effects they could have. Well, I, I wanted to, to give an example uh, which is uh, similar to what uh, Hema said before about forest fires, and this is a practice that has been uh, um, taken up recently in Greece. So uh, in case uh, summer we have uh, forest fires, uh, there has been developed a system 
that shows uh, the cause of the fire and also that uh, also alerts if it is getting near to villages or small uh, towns in order to avoid casualties for uh, people but also for stock or for uh, cutlery and all this stuff and i think it's quite important and this is actually what means uh, uh, sustainability and, and better quality of people if you cannot uh, at least uh, prevail and uh, um, quit or uh, avoid, that's the word I was looking for, avoid uh, some uh, natural hazards or natural, uh, natural disasters, at least you have to be able to protect some kind of your people, protect the citizens and find ways to advise them, to alert them. And uh, this is something that has been uh, put into uh, practice uh, recently with uh, successful uh, results. Any uh, other questions? Uh, people maybe from other areas of Europe who uh, have examples of how uh, digitization can be uh, implemented for sustainability issues, greening issues, maybe from a, a bottom-up way that's maybe not necessarily in cities? Yes? So to just give a short idea of an answer to the question, so Maarten van Schie, also a PBL colleague of uh, David. Uh, I think that one of the ways that nature might, or that uh, digitization might help, is with just uh, databases of examples, uh, like ways that nature is being used creatively or whatever, uh, because then it gives ideas, and I think this spread of ideas might be a good way to inspire. So that's that's the one thing that I can think of how digitization might actually help make Europe more sustainable and greener. Because in the end it has to influence people's actions. Digitization itself is not going to make the world greener. So, so even if you're in a, uh, a very remote area, you still through the digitization have access to all these practices and maybe you uh, learn about some excellent practice in another region which is similar to your region but maybe very far away. Okay, good. Yeah, and that ties into the, uh, let's say, the um, ecological services uh, idea too. Okay. Um, let's see, should we take another Slido uh, question? Let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, well, we have enough for maybe one last question on Slido. Let's see what we've got. Uh, the top is, I think we've already... That's more to our policymakers. Uh, maybe if we take the top one, do, do you think of all these p concepts that you've heard, you've heard quite a few from the, uh, from the chapter that was presented and uh, some here on the panel discussion, what do you think you're going to take home the most that you think, uh, this is something that I can really uh, tell my, uh, my colleagues at home, this is what I learned uh, at ESPON about how we should uh, improve greening from a more territorial perspective, from more of a European perspective, thinking away borders. Um, your, your biggest uh, takeaway? Well, I would uh, try to avoid answering, and I would say that I will take back home all of these and let the Ministry of Environment and Energy to decide how they are going to use uh, these. But apart from that, I think that uh, the more important thing is that we have to, to approach uh, green infrastructure in a positive way, um, considering it as a challenge and also taking into consideration how it can be further elaborated from a, a special uh, planning point of view. And this is, I think, a good point to reconcile policymakers and special planners back at home and make them work together on this particular uh, field of expertise. Uh, I will let my colleague uh, to answer that. I'm, I'm curious about Croatia, about the interface between, let's say, spatial planning and the territorial perspective and, and whether uh, ESPON can help form a bridge between these. Yes. Uh, well, as you know, uh, in Croatia we have a long tradition of physical planning. 
uh, it dates from um, from uh, socialist uh, era era, and um, uh, well, I think uh, that we need uh, some other approach in um, looking at the, at our territory. Uh, but uh, the problem uh, that we are facing now, uh, we have very strict uh, process of um, uh, developing the, the uh, physical plans. Uh, it should be, um, because we have a uh, like act of physical planning, it is the main plan. And uh, if we want uh, something to be in our plans, we, it should be, um, it should be uh, according to the act. And so we can use ESPON data only in some analytical phase, but not the later on, in later phases. So I think that we have to change our mindset, maybe, and to learn how to use new approaches or new data, for example, ESPON data, uh, which are very, very uh, valuable. And uh, we have luck that uh, we are, uh, I'm working for a ministry that is in charge for physical planning. And also I'm an ESPON MC member. So I can help my colleagues to use data, but only in analytical phase of developing the, the uh, physical plans. So that is a challenge for us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, wrap this up. Thank you all for uh, contributing here on the panel. Thank you for your introduction of the, the chapter. Uh, it's quite daunting, the uh, science policy interface, uh, as we started off, that you uh, can produce all this knowledge and uh, it can disappear and evaporate, uh, but the whole point of ESPON is to actually have it get used. And uh, there's a, a large way to go, let's say, from the producers on the science side to, let's say, the politicians. And somewhere in between, you have the policymakers, the officials, who actually might read some ESPON reports uh, in the middle. And you also have the uh, European dimension, which we're working at, which is uh, thinking away borders. But then as you go down, the borders sometimes get more and more important down to the municipal level, where uh, it's a question of whether a dam should be built in my municipality or further, or whether that windmill in my municipality should come or in, in, in the neighbor. So those are little battles that are being waged which are uh, quite far removed from some of the discussions we hear, have here at ESPON. And in, in addition, the whole idea of uh, integrated versus sectoral. Uh, we always talk about integrated, uh, thinking away the borders between policy sectors, and yet, uh, we all work in very fragmented uh, bureaucracies many times, and they're all fragmented in different ways, it seems. And at every single level, that fragmentation is different. So it's highly complex to get this message from the science to the actual implementation. So I thank all of you for contributing to this, and uh, let's continue to repeat the message that uh, sometimes you have to try to think away the borders to see something new to see the problem in a different perspective and uh, to try to bring that to the people whose responsibility it is actually to make policy within those borders. So thank you very much and thank all of you. And uh, I think this concludes our uh, workshop.